We'll just take a moment of uh, reflection, colleagues. Thank you very much. <laughs> Colleagues, just before we begin, um, I have a very significant announcement to make. Um, John Traves has been here 10 years. Uh, earlier this year, he got his 10-year CAMA pin. Uh, it's my pleasure to give him his 10-year uh, uh, pin. In uh, keeping with the legal profession, it's not real gold. It's uh, made to look real, but it's not actually. Um, but it is an actual pin. And it is round, like the endless arguments we get into legally here at uh, City Hall. Anyway, John, seriously, thank you very much for 10 years of uh, outstanding service to the municipality. Oh. Pin it on my forehead. <laughs> thank you. Oh, Trisha, thank you. Look at that, Trisha. Oh. Anybody else want to get a shot at a lawyer? <laughs> All right, colleagues, uh, it is October the 17th. I want to begin our meeting acknowledging where we are. We're on Mi'kma'ki, in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional, the unsurrendered land of them, the Mi'kmaq people. We uh, honor that through the treaties of peace and friendship, which uh, started in the 1720s between uh, the Mi'kmaq and the Crown and did not involve uh, the surrender or handing over uh, of land. Um, okay, I'm going to see if we have any uh, community Announcements. Seeing none. Oh, Councillor Kent. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to acknowledge the um, ceremony of the Memorial of Pollen Peace Officers that we had on Sunday. It was uh, a beautiful ceremony at the RCMP headquarters. I want to acknowledge the committee that worked so hard to bring it forward, and particularly uh, acknowledge with gratitude the number of people that attended. You know, we can't understate the importance of continuing to honor those that are serving in our communities, uh, particularly those that have, you know, sacrificed the ultimate um, sacrifice and the families that uh, have to pick up the pieces afterwards. But thank you to every council member that could be, be there and those who can't. I know that your thoughts are with us, but uh, I think it's important to acknowledge again. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Um, I first of all wanted to uh, recognize a young man in Lower Sackville, Zach Kerrigan. He has been playing lacrosse for a number of years and recently he has been drafted by the Thunderbirds. So it's, it's thrilling to see that, uh, that someone, again, from Sackville has made it onto the Thunderbirds. That, that's a huge accomplishment, so congratulations, Zach. Um, secondly, we have a, uh, a development in Lower Sackville or a proposed development uh, on First Lake Drive for a number of apartment buildings and there is a public hearing for those coming up on November 1st and 2nd at the Sackville High Auditorium, uh, sorry, the Sackville High Cafeteria. Uh, seating is limited. Uh, you can find the um, more information about that uh, on my website and on the halifax.ca website. And I'm wearing a tie today that I got uh, a little while ago. It is in recognition of, of Remembrance Day. It's got the, uh, the poppy on it. Uh, because we will not be back here in council chambers until after Remembrance Day. So for anybody who is in or around Sackville, uh, we are again having our, uh, the, uh, the Remembrance Day ceremony uh, on November 11th at the Sackville Cenotaph. Uh, show up early. There are thousands of people who come down to recognize this, this, um, this very necessary day. 
uh, the the sacrifices that uh, that those who came before us have have gone through has been incredible, uh, and I'm thankful that we don't have to uh, go through that now. Um, so please join us on on uh, November 11th uh, in Sackville. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to let Council and those watching at home that I went to the Get to Know Your Municipality at the Western on Saturday, October 14th, and it was very impressive. We had booths from every area in HRM, uh, from transit and, uh, uh, gosh, I just can't name all of them, but all our different departments, waste, uh, they had actually had some provincial departments there, um, job junction, and a few more that I won't name because there was a whole list of them, but it was an honor to be there. I was going to mention the fallen peace officers, but uh, Councillor can't beat me to it. And I'd also let you, know, let you know that every third Tuesday of each month at Trinity United Baptist Church in Timberley, uh, from 10 to a.m. to 2 p.m., they'll be serving a free will a lunch. So all are invited. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to let Council and the public uh, know that the 17th annual, <coughs> pardon me, 17th annual Mission Breakfast for Brunswick Street Mission takes place Thursday, October 19th, 7.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, with a uh, full breakfast and my friend, keynote speaker, April Howe will be speaking. Uh, she's been an active voice for diversity and inclusion in Nova Scotia for many years and I'm quite looking forward to it. Tickets are still available. You can find them on the BrunswickStreetMission.org website. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Two quick announcements. One on Sunday, October 22nd, and will be the George Dixon Garden Community Potluck in barbecue. Uh, they're looking for volunteers who'd like to help, uh, so you can reach out to Missy at Nancy, Nancy Myra Ross at gmail.com or call her 902-225-5120 to volunteer if you'd like to help at this potluck, which the mm -hmm. first line is sizzling lineup for you. We're firing up the grill for serving melt-watering hot dogs, juicy burgers, and a selection of refreshing beverages. That, that, just reading that made me hungry for a barbecue. And the last announcement is on October 30th at 10 a.m. will be the official Cornwallis Street renaming to Nor Bernard. So that will be happening at the uh, Halifax Common at the corner of North Park Street and North Bernard Street, uh, formerly known as Cornwall Street, and that's from 10 to 12, and I will be there, and I know there will be some other special guests as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just, uh, first, I would like to thank my colleagues and staff for speaking and coming together yesterday at Law Amendments. Um, it was great uh, to see all the comments, a diversity of comments from all the councillors. I sincerely appreciate um, the participation. Uh, you know, this is a devastating bill, 329, and uh, I just want to say thank you for speaking out on behalf of the residents and businesses of HRM. Uh, I do want to also recognize that October 18th is Persons Day in Canada. It's the 94th anniversary of Persons Day. And with that, uh, women finally won the right to be recognized as persons under the law in this country only 94 years ago. Uh, and we are very pleased to welcome uh, Michelle Obama to uh, Halifax tomorrow and um, very excited to celebrate Persons Day with her. I also would like folks to know that on November the 22nd, we will have a hazard risk and vulnerability assessment it, at the Seabright Legion. Uh, that'll be the second uh, meeting. Uh, and I really do hope that more people come out to talk about the hazards within our municipality. And lastly, Mr. Mayor, uh, a shout out to the Hubbard's Heritage Society. They had an incredible dinner on Saturday and uh, appreciated the scroll that uh, I presented on behalf of yourself, Mayor, Ma uh, Mayor Savage, and Regional Council for their 175th anniversary of St. Luke's Church in Hubbard's. And what a great event it was. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Thank you. Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Coming up on Saturday, October 21st, uh, starting at 6 o'clock at the Seaforth Hall is the annual potato weigh-in and competition for, um, for all those who are, like to grow their own potatoes in the neighborhood. And also that evening is a pie auction. The kids are there from 6 to 9 after 9 o'clock. It's adult, uh, adults only. And the pie auction gets quite outrageous at times with prize going for over, well over 100 bucks uh, easily. Also that same evening, 7 o'clock, the Sheet Harbor Marina having its auction and uh, dinner uh, in the Sheet Harbor uh, Lion Center. On Sunday, October 22nd, the Eastern Shore Wildlife uh, Forest Watch uh, will be having its 25th anniversary at the Deanery in uh, West Ship Harbor. On Saturday, October 28th at 1 o'clock, the uh, Gatesbrook Greenway will be a Halloween walk uh, for the kids to come out and uh, get some treats and dress up uh, for the Halloween period. Also, 3 o'clock that afternoon, there'll be a haunted house at the Porters Lake Community Service Association, Porters Lake on Highway Number 7. And coming up on the following Saturday, the 4th of November, the Dutchman's Supper at Seaforth Hall from 4 to 6. And then there's the, uh, on Sunday, November the 5th, the Preston Area Remembrance Day Church Service at 10.30 at New Beginnings Ministry. And on Thursday, the 9th of November, 6 o'clock, the Lake and Shore Community Rec Center Annual General Meeting at the Porters Lake Elementary School. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I am thrilled to announce that this year the Mayor's Bike Ride will be taking place in Spryfield uh, next weekend on October 22nd from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. This year's ride begins at the Captain William Spry Community Centre and there will be a reception with refreshments um, afterwards. So I want to invite all of my council colleagues and all of those who might be listening might be listening online um, to come out to Spry Field and join us on the Mayor's Bike Ride. Uh, this will be followed the next day on Monday with the Bike Summit, which is also taking place in Spry Field at the Captain William Spry Centre. Um, as I understand it, registration for that summit is, is now full, which is fabulous to hear. Um, but it will be a great opportunity um, to hear about you know, what's been happening in AT, active transportation um, around the city and around the province over the past year and uh, to bring all the, the partners uh, working in that space together to discuss where we go next. So um, very excited to be hosting this in Spryfield. There in in kind of the build up to the bike summit and the mayor's bike ride, we uh, the EAC um, is also doing a mini pop-up hub um, in Spryfield and they will be on um, uh, near, next to uh, Roche's Pond Park. Um, they have a trailer there and they invite uh, anyone to come down and get their bike tuned up so uh, they're ready to roll with the mayor. Thank you. All right. I thought we were uh, uh, cycling from Spryfield to uh, Cape Breton uh, this year, but if it's shorter than that, I understand. Is that correct? I need my mic back. There we go. Uh, that is correct. Uh, this year, um, th that will be training. We'll be training for riding to Cape Breton. Um, this year, we'll explore the Macintosh Community Trail Great. and um, also get to check out the new bike lines on Herring Cove Road um, down the 500 block, which um, look fabulous. So it'll be Great. nice for everyone to see that. Thank you. Thank you. And I do want to thank, as you did, uh, staff, our staff at HRM who organized these. We've been all over the municipality with these bike rides and many parts of Dartmouth and Halifax. We've been out to uh, Sackville uh, for these. We've done the Chain Lakes Trail. We've been to Coal Harbor. Um, we have, and I look very much forward to, uh, is it this Sunday? Next Sunday, whenever it is. It's the 22nd. 22nd, all yeah, right. So, and um, I, I also hear that uh, Mancini is uh, is coming with his mountain bike and is going to challenge us to... Um, uh, okay, well, oh, let's me. not get into just the base. <laughs> okay, just me right. on the single track trails, the Macintosh runs single track trails. So if anyone has a mountain bike, um, <laughs> that will be a great opportunity too if you've never checked out. You can hike them as well. The, the single track trails are absolutely amazing, all built by volunteers. And um, yeah, I welcome everyone to Spryfield. Awesome. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor David Gammon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I was going to remind you about <clears throat> the jam session in Lemon Hill again, which is on October 22nd. So I guess she'll be on a bike in Spryfield. Um, but if people aren't on bikes, 
come out to the jam session in Lemon Hill with me. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, but I'm sure, uh, Mr. Mayor, we will find a date before the snow flies that will get you out there, I hope. So that would be good. Um, the uh, In terms of Remembrance Day, uh, in as district, as vast as District 1, there are five locations where there are Remembrance Day celebrations. And so this year, I'm very pleased to say that I'll be at the Windsor Junction Cenotaph, and I can actually walk from the house over to the Cenotaph, so that would be kind of cool. Um, so uh, to everyone, I do hope that you have a Remembrance Day celebration um, that acknowledges uh, those who came before us who suffered so that we can sit in this chamber today and vote and have a democracy that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I neglected to give credit where credit was due. I now have a list of the events that happened at Get to Know Your Municipality. I understand there was over 100 people that attended. There was information about HRM parks and rec, emergency services, elections, solid waste, transit, fire, 311 contact center, Halifax Public Libraries, Nova Scotia Works, Junction, Job Junction, Halifax Human Rights Commission, and more. So I just wanted to, to uh, uh, bring your awareness to that because it was a very well attended event. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple of short snappers, folks. Uh, Look forward, uh, Councillor Austin, to joining you and perhaps others at downtown Dartmouth this Friday, which was um, postponed from a few weeks ago um, when I couldn't make it when I went to Bruce Guthrow's funeral. So I appreciate Tim Rosesco and the team accommodating that. Um, this morning, I was at a cool event. It was a celebration at the Halifax Partnership. And it was a celebration of the significant fact that the Halifax Partnership recently won some very distinguished awards for economic development. Um, the IEDC, the International Economic Development Council Awards were in Dallas and the partnership won a number of things, including gold for economic development organization of the year. That's not in Canada or the North America, that's in the world for cities of 200 to 500,000 people. And uh, our uh, Halifax Partnership won the gold award for that, so that's pretty significant. So let's have a little round of applause for the Halifax Partnership. <laughs> Wendy and the team. And I also want to mention that I will be leaving you before the public hearing tonight to be on the Republic of Korea Training Task Group on board reception to toast them on behalf of the citizens of Halifax, our uh, colleagues in the Korean Navy, and I want to thank the Deputy Mayor. I think you did something yesterday for that, for which I, uh, I hear you were great, so thank you. Did you want to speak to that? Uh, Councillor Austin on that? Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. It, it was indeed an honour to be able to welcome them to our city. It is the very first time um, the Republic of Korea has had a, one of their ships calling on our port, so that was a pretty special occasion. And so if you see a bunch of uh, South Koreans wandering around the city over the next few days, uh, that is that is why. And I understand you went out with them last night and just got home a few hours ago, so thank you for your... <laughs> Thank you for that, colleagues. We'll move to uh, minutes of uh, September 26th and October 3rd. Hello. Moved by Councillor Hensby, seconded by Councillor Mason. All in favor? Those opposed? Those are carried. Thank you. The order of business. We'll go to the clerk first. Yes, Mr. Mayor, we have one addition. Information item six, memorandum of the Chief Administrative Officer dated October 16th, 2023, regarding legislative update 2023, fall sitting and bill number 329. Okay, does that need to be approved by everybody? That's, uh, that's an item at this point. That'll be on the agenda. Is everybody okay with that? For now, we'll see if anybody else has anything else on that. Uh, uh, Councillor Mason on that. Do we require a motion to bring that on to the agenda for discussion today, or is that an information item? John will speak to that. It is an, it is an information item that would require a motion to add it to the agenda, notwithstanding the rules. And are staff prepared to present today if such a motion was made? I see a nod. I'll make a motion. And, and, all, and all members of council. It requires here. unanimous vote, so everybody has to approve. Councilor Mason? I would ask that this be brought forward for discussion today. 
And you wanted to bring it forward at the beginning of? At the beginning. At yeah. the beginning of agenda. Uh, so uh, to bring it forward and to put it at the beginning of agenda, um, I'll just see if anybody's opposed to that. Then I'll say that that is unanimously adopted, that we will bring it forward on the agenda and we will deal with it. Uh, where do we deal with it, Madam Clerk? Perhaps before reports. Yep, we will uh, we'll put it on the agenda accordingly under added items, but uh, we will we can address it before. Um, yeah, let's move it to before reports. Before right, reports, before, yeah. uh, Sorry, let's do it after petitions. Mm -hmm. and before Councillor Russell's brought forward motion, okay? All right, anybody else? Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I respectfully request that item, information item number five, mem memorandum from the Chief Administrative Officer, dated July 10th, 2023, regarding the Upper Tan Talon wildfire lessons learned, uh, be referred to Committee of the Whole, please, at a later date. Okay, that's been referred to a Committee of the Whole at a later date for agenda review to schedule, seconded by Councillor Hensby. Any discussion on that? Maybe we'll go to the machines on that, uh, Madam Clerk. That's carried, thank you. Anybody else? Does somebody want to move the approval of the order of business as amended? Moved by Councillor Lovely, second by Councillor Stoddard. All in favor? Done. Consent agenda, colleagues. Does somebody want to move the consent agenda? Moved by Councillor Daigle Gammon, seconded by Councillor Kent. Ready for the question on the consent agenda. That's carried, colleagues. So I'll just review what we have passed by consent. Item 13.1.1, this is a fly past request for Remembrance Day, 13.1.1. 15.1.2 is HRM asset names. That's passed by consent, but I can't let it pass without acknowledging Bill Withers, former councillor in the city of Dartmouth, has been added to the book of commemorative names, as has who else, Councillor Mancini? Miles Goodwin. Yes. April Wine. Eh? Who what a night, yeah. Uh, the great Miles Goodwin, who I had the pleasure of inducting into the Nova Scotia Music Casino Hall of Fame. Uh, and um, 1513, FCM Annual Conference and Trade Show Bid. Those have all been passed by consent. Business arising, seeing none, calls for declaration of conflicts Motions of reconsideration, rescission, deferred business, tabled matters, none. There is a public hearing tonight. Deputy Mayor, you'll probably be in the docket for that one. You're okay with, to go with that? Okay, so passed. <laughs> Councillor Lovelace, former Deputy Mayor, will be in the chair for the public hearing tonight. Correspondence. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, we have received correspondence for items, apologies, 1515, information three, and information item five. Thank you. Petitions, colleagues? Okay, this is where we will insert the item that was um, added which is a memorandum from the CAO dated October 16th regarding legislative update 2023 fall sitting, Bill 329. CAO, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. I apologize that this report was not circulated to you until last night, but of course the bill was tabled on October 12th and law amendments occurred yesterday. So we were not able to finalize the report for your review until that time. 
So on October 12th, the government of Nova Scotia introduced for first reading Bill 329, which is regarding the HRM Charter and Housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality Act. We did not have a um, draft of the re bill to review in advance, although we were aware that something might be coming because some of the amendments that are there are actually things that the municipality had requested to help us put into effect the uh, rapid housing, the housing accelerator fund. So some of the changes were things that the municipality required. There were, however, a number of amendments proposed that the municipality had not requested and were surprised by. And over the course of the last, I will say, two days, three days, there has been much back and forth. There has been a meeting with uh, provincial staff yesterday morning, so we had an opportunity to get clarification on some items. And of course, uh, the bill was at law amendments yesterday afternoon, where the mayor and I and a number of councillors and also representatives from Halifax Water uh, were present to speak to the Law Amendments Committee. The Law Amendments Committee did uh, vote to pass the bill onwards to the House for third reading without making amendments. However, there is opportunity still in the process that amendments could be made at third reading or could be made at Committee of the Whole. So we are very hopeful in some of the discussions that have occurred and as a result of some of the presentations that we've made that there is a better understanding of some of the impact of the clauses now and that there will be amendments made before the bill is finalized. But this is the first opportunity for council to actually discuss the bill as it was proposed and to give um, some feedback on what is there in the bill or to ask questions of clarification regarding what is in the bill and what things uh, staff may be concerned about. And with me today to answer questions, we have a number of staff from planning and development and we also have uh, Louis de Montbrun and Kenda McKenzie here from Halifax Water. Okay, just before we begin discussion, I just want to be very clear. Uh, the CIO indicated that some of the parts of the bill may not have been a total surprise, but the bill itself was a complete surprise. So there have been discussions, there was no indication that something was going to be introduced. Um, uh, and certainly, um, as far reaching um, and uh, as much of a dramatic encroachment into municipal affairs uh, as it is. So just to be very clear about that, I received a text from the minister late Wednesday night, um, evening at 521, and we chatted for a couple of minutes. He was unable to tell me what was in the legislation, um, other than to say that uh, some of it would work well with the housing accelerator funding that we had announced earlier in the day. So the rest of it was a bit of a... Uh, mystery, let's say. Okay, uh, okay, uh, so thanks to the staff for being here. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and thank you, staff. Of, you know, it's one of those interesting times to be deputy because you get to see a little bit of the scramble that happens when something like this occurs, and, you know, I very much appreciate uh, CEO and all the staff that really kind of had to move very quickly and do uh, basically all hands on deck to uh, respond to this. Um, I'm wondering, like, uh, and of course I, I spoke at law amendments on this point uh, the other day, uh, what I'm wondering about um, as a question for the CEO and for staff is what the uh, implications of this bill are for our affordable housing programs because it's my understanding just from where we kind of left off on Friday is that this could very much in peril, um, density bonusing and inclusionary zoning, which I really think is worth emphasizing for you know the public, because that's literally if if that's if that's how this plays out, we're literally going to the this bill would block us 
from investing in nonprofits doing deeply affordable housing in the midst of a housing crisis in order to subsidize for-profit development, which is maybe not what people were intending. So I was wondering if we can get some clarification on that as to where our maybe most up-to-date thinking is, because mine goes back to Friday. Thank you, and we have our Director of Regional Planning, Kate Green, here. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Mayor, Regional Council, Kate Green. I'm the Director of Regional and Community Policy. Uh, so our, we've been working through our thinking on how this impacts our affordable housing program. So first up, uh, we have an affordable housing uh, density bonusing program in the regional center where the rates um, by which we collect density bonusing are written right into the bylaw. Our understanding is those would be able to be, continue to be applied, but they wouldn't be able to be increased. So we do have um, it written in that will increase um, basically the equivalent of CPI on an annual basis. Um, my understanding is that works out to about $500,000 a year, so a million dollars over the two year period approximately, give or take. In our suburban areas, we've created an interim density bonusing program and that density bonusing program applies to uh, applications where there's a request for change to policy. And in those instances, we require a density bonusing agreement and we will not be able to enter into new density bonusing agreements under the terms of this as we understand it. So we will not be able to collect density bonusing charges in those areas. And of course, if I could just chime yeah. in, density bonusing, 60, 70 percent of the funds we collect there goes into affordable housing, right? So the density bonusing money is used for our affordable housing grant program, uh, which, you know, people, we run on an annual basis and our uh, not-for-profit um, entities can apply to access those funds for projects. And uh, the inclusionary zoning we're still not clear on. And that's something I think we need to ask the province for clarity on. Uh, we haven't established the full program yet. There will be um, likely there will be a housing agreement that's needed. It might not need to be a density bonusing agreement, but there will be terms established that will indicate how long a particular unit needs to be maintained as an affordable unit. And that will be a contractual obligation that will have financial impacts for the developer, so we're unclear on how that fits in um, to the legislation at this point in time. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the inclusionary piece, um, going back to the report we had, um, common in other jurisdictions uh, to have the ability, uh, if you don't want to include units for whatever reason, um, there's an ability to provide cash in lieu. Would that be constrained by this? Um, would that be considered a fee? In the, excuse me, through the mayor to the councillor, uh, in the regional centre we will still be able to collect fees for density bonusing. In the suburban areas our understanding is we would not be able to establish new fees in a method similar to the centre. Um, so if we aren't able to establish the inclusionary bonus zoning program and establish agreements by which we'll have units, my interpretation at this point would be that we wouldn't be able to collect funds in Leah. Um. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, I think you know, there are some folks who don't like the density bonusing piece. Um, some of the developers, I think there was two of them that spoke maybe yesterday at law amendments um, because it is, it is a fee, but it's a fee that goes to a very important public good. It goes to providing uh, nonprofit housing the, of the affordable kind that developers just can't. Right, so um, to, cur to curtail us from doing that work is to me deeply problematic. So hopefully that'll be one of the pieces that gets amended if the province is going to actually make some edits here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, it's been interesting. I'm not often uh, at a loss for words and this is now the second time in two days that I'm kind of at a loss for words. Uh, a friend of mine asked me yesterday why I, I am legitimately very upset and angry about what the government's doing and I talked a little bit about, and uh, forgive me, I know I'm doing my professor type thing again, in between Joseph Howe, 
winning the libel trial and getting us freedom of the press and getting responsible government in the late 1840s, there's a thir there, the third thing that he was known for in his life of public service was the fight to incorporate the city of Halifax in 1841, first incorporated government in Nova Scotia. And that fight was important because it gave the people, because we didn't have responsible government yet, the ability to control how their town, how their city grew without interference from the executive council, the governor, and the legislature. So we're literally sitting through a period where the sitting government of Nova Scotia has decided to undo 180, 190 years of work, going back to Joseph Howe, and walk away from this key bit of history about establishing democracy in British North America. So good job down there at the legislature. Thanks for that. As I said yesterday, if the goal is to get housing approvals completed faster, uh, as fast as possible, then we should be talking about what the uh, systemic, systematic problems are in our system that are slowing down housing construction, of which approvals and permitting is a, a part, but a small part. We certainly heard, we had the one developer speak yesterday, uh, you know, I'll be candid, uh, eventually that property should probably be developed, but putting at the end of Herring Cove Road another 3,000 people at this juncture is probably not the best plan today. We need to build out toward that. And that's why it's not something that we want to consider. And there are dozens of examples of that around the city that if they go to the top of the list because somebody's able to get in and talk to the minister, that that's not going to be good for the city in terms of long-term costs, traffic, and all the services that we need to get to. So if there's no clear objective for why, as I said yesterday, for why the province is doing what it's doing, they have not provided clear guidance. When the Premier was asked in the scrum when they dropped the, the legislation, he said, I don't have any examples of what this is trying to fix. We all just know that Halifax is bad at its job. I am paraphrasing, but that's basically what he said. If we really want to fix things, what we need is we need to know exactly what we're trying to fix, what the changes will do in terms of measurable improvements, and we need to be able to evaluate whether those changes have made any, any improvements at all. And so, uh, you know, it's important to remind everyone that the minister, before any of this happened, in the charter, has the power to mandate goals in a timeline to Atrium Council. If you want things done faster, the minister has the ability to tell us to make things go faster. Section 242, I think. I saw Lisa uh, looking questioning at me. Uh, so there's no need for this. There's no, hasn't been a need for any of the things that have been done by the provincial government so far. The big difference between what they were allowed to do and what they've proposed and what they've done is that their changes happen behind closed doors. If you tell us it's going to be time bound and you got to get it done in 120 days, then we have a public process and it's all in the full light of day. But right now, the minister gets to decide who lives and who dies. There is no public process, there is no criteria, there is no clear on-ramp, there's no opportunity for the public or the municipality to provide new information. Minister Lohr will just decide. And that's wrong, that is first order wrong, it's not ethical, it's not right, it's anti-democratic, and that's why we're fighting, that's why we think that, it, that, that's why we were all down there at the legislature, so many of us yesterday. So. Uh, fill in the blanks as to why they've decided the most effective way to deal with this is to do it behind closed doors. I will let your imagination fill in those blanks. As far as the density bonus piece goes, that feels like uh, a real good round of play stupid games and win stupid prizes. Like this is where we're at is, oh, you know what? These people don't want to pay for that? Well, that's good. Now we're not going to have the ability to raise money to pay for affordable housing in the suburbs. That's fantastic, you know, just as a reminder to everybody, density bonusing is buying air rights. You want to build a bigger building, what's the community going to get out of it? We want housing, but you want a bigger building, give us a little bit of cash. Not a huge amount of cash either. And so uh, the fact that this has become the kind of thing that the province is willing to uh, end as an option for the suburbs is appalling. So uh, I don't really have any questions. I just wanted to say for the record again how like, poorly conceived and dumb this is and, and how disappointed I am that the government will not talk to us. As the land use regulator and subject matter experts, they will not come and talk to us to find out what we think could be done to make planning go faster. They just keep throwing spaghetti at the wall hoping that it sticks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I do have questions. Um, you know, I, I, I agree that the implications of this are unknown, uh, partly because uh, there, there was no consultation, no discussion. So how could we work through what uh, the potential implications are? Um, and it's interesting in this report, uh, in the section for risk consideration, <laughs> it says not applicable. Um, well, it is pretty uh, darn applicable. Uh, because there are some serious risks uh, to Bill 329, which we talked about at law amendments, um, you know, uh, and, there, and there are potential harms that could come forward uh, to our communities. And considering that there was no consultation with HRM, uh, it, even though it states in the Halifax Charter that there should be conversations, um, the Municipal Government Act, we're talking about what needs to happen at the Nova Scotia Federation Municipalities. We're talking with the provincial government and staff all the time uh, about the service exchange agreement. And so to be blindsided by this, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't um, do well for the relationship as far as how we can actually build a strong Nova Scotia if the province doesn't want us at the table considering we're the capital region with half the population. So uh, my questions are the implications of Halifax Council pulling our staff from the housing panel. Clearly, that housing panel doesn't have much of a role, uh, certainly didn't have a role in uh, Bill 329. And my other questions uh, are when we think about the conversations uh, regarding um, you know, what gets approved by the minister, for example, those are gonna happen behind closed doors. But the implications will be discussed here because we'll, we will be talking about the finan financial implications to the property tax bill. And so that will be public as far as uh, infrastructure costs, what's happening with rate payers, um, you know, what, what happens with the capital cost contributions. We are already in a significant deficit situation with regards to infrastructure. We have over 50 wooden cross culverts. We have to replace one on Hammonds Plains Road uh, in two weeks, less than two weeks. That means shutting the road down. We get 20,000 plus vehicles on that road every day. Um, just think about the costs to uh, our communities in doing that work. And Who's going to pay for it? So when I look at the capital cost contributions, uh, we look at Port Wallace special planning area. Uh, this is whatever page this is on the financial implications section. Uh, sorry about that. Page eight. Uh, we've got uh, developer infrastructure fees, approximately 19 million, and municipal fees were around 10 million. So I I'm looking at our CAO from a cost implication perspective. We need to be able to understand what this means for the future of our budget. We're going to be entering budget discussions next month. I'm extremely concerned uh, about what this means to staff as far as the work that they've been doing to present their budgets um, to us in the coming months and thinking about uh, just, just the potential harm to the property tax bill and how, how we're gonna be able to move forward with our capital plans. So I'm just wondering if the CIO can speak to that. Um, I, and and you know, I, I know that again, you don't really know what this means, but how are we gonna mitigate uh, the expense and the loss of our capital uh, projects, which, which we have planned right now? I will perhaps start the answer, and then I will ask Jacqueline Hamilton, our Executive Director of Planning and Development, to give her thoughts on the participation in the Executive Panel on Housing. Thank you. Um, with respect to the question regarding our long-range infrastructure planning and financing, uh, one of the things we conveyed at law amendments yesterday was the importance of us being able to do meaningful long-range planning for mm -hmm. infrastructure and how to fund it. One of the main clauses we had concern with was clause four that um, impacted our ability to levy new or change existing charges related to development that are critical to funding infrastructure. Yeah. Most infrastructure in new development areas is already heavily pub publicly subsidized, but we do have some 
fees, capital cost contributions in the case mm -hmm. of the municipality or some regional CCCs or the regional development charge in the okay. case of Halifax Water that are critical to fund the infrastructure for new master planned communities, mm -hmm. these new growth areas, which bring huge cost. And if we don't have those development charges in place, then there's only two or three options. We would need to look for funding from other levels of government, the provincial government and federal government to help us fund the infrastructure. The infrastructure might not get built nope. and the community might not have those services exactly. or that level of service. And the third option would be, um, it would be on the municipal tax rate. Thank you. And I'll ask uh, Jacqueline to speak to the executive panel on housing. Yes, Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor. Uh, I guess the implication, and first of all, I'll state that I'm not on the ha housing panel. We have two other staff that are representing uh, HRM on the housing panel that are joining me here today. But just at a high level, I, I think one of the key benefits of our participation on the panel has been really um, the opportunity for a flow of information and communication, not, not on this particular bill, but uh, in terms of our coordination and prioritization of uh, the initiatives being worked on and alignment with Council's direction. So certainly there are some risks associated with that. Um, I would also add that uh, uh, the opportunity to coordinate on um, infrastructure supports that are required um, to accommodate development would be a risk that I'd highlight. Uh, and the third area would be just really the, the resourcing implications for staff, really uh, not having a good handle on where to put the resources uh, to support the effort and it being sort of a, an uncoordinated approach moving forward. All right. Uh, thank you. I want to acknowledge um, Ben Jessam, the uh, MLA from Hammonds Plains, and I think Lucasville, who's joined us in the gallery. Thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, oh, there's a, a number of concerns here and questions um, that I have about this. Uh, one of them is about the recent approval um, Council gave to increasing some fees uh, by 25%. And I'm wondering if those have been passed and are enacted or if this in any way jeopardizes um, that increase in fees that we've approved, um, if, if that will be going forward. That, that, that's one question. Um, the other one is, are there any other motions that are have, you know, waiting for staff reports? Um, that might be jeopardized by this new legislation as well. Is there anything in the pipe that's coming down to us that we might not be able to move forward on um, given, given Bill 329? The other thing is about the density bonusing. And I agree with Councillor Mason that it is, and, and Councillor Austin, I mean, it's very, very short-sighted. In fact, the density bonusing is designed specifically to address the major challenge that we're trying to solve in this province, and it's how do we get affordable, like deeply affordable housing out there in our city for those who need it most. Again, it's not the top 20% of income, you know, in the, in the income range. It's not the top 20 that needs housing. There's, there's actually quite, you know, a lot of housing options for people who have have the, the funds for it. It's, it's the bottom 20. It's the, it's the deeply affordable rent geared to income, the type of housing that gets built and, and managed and supported by our not-for-profit sector, which is exactly what that density bonusing program was designed to do. The challenge now of not being able to do that outside the regional center is that we completely eliminate not for profits for seeking solutions outside the regional center where, where land might be less expensive, where there are more affordable options to, to actually build housing. So, you know, it, it's, it's completely counter to what we actually need to be doing right now. It makes, it makes no sense. So if the provincial government is serious about addressing the housing crisis, 
I really think they need to rethink that piece around the density bonusing because that's one of the few tools we have as a municipality for addressing the, the housing crisis. Um, my other concern is, well, and, and with that, with the density bonusing, you know, um, I've, I've spoken to some developers who f are from out of province, and they said like, they, they can't believe that the municipality upzones without making them pay for that increase in upzoning. We're, we're one of the few places in the country that, that does that. And, uh, and, you know, and, you know they, they can't believe it. They, they think it's like a windfall. That's not the intent either. I mean, we want to see housing. We want to support housing development. But at the same time, we need to see that opportunity come back to the city and making our city work and function and be successful. And you know, density bonusing is just one small part that we have to, one small thing we have to be able to do that. My other concern is around parkland. And we've talked about this several times at council about how when we subdivide land, you get a parkland acquisition a fee gets applied. We've been looking to see how can we do something similar when we, you know, when we build tall towers um, so that we can get some money to invest in parkland, which will support the residents in those densest areas. We know that density is, you know, it's a good thing, but it's only successful if you have the green space and the parkland to support the residents that live in those neighborhoods. We've asked the province for this, the ability to do this. Um, my fear is that with, with Bill 329, that, you know, it's, it, well, it's not a fear, it's actually kind of a reality. They're saying, no, like, you, you know, more fees, no more new development fees, we, we, can't, we can't do that. So how are we gonna pay for, for parkland in areas where, where we need it most. Um, it's gonna come from the subdivision of land in other places. I, it doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. So that is, uh, that's another piece that I, that I hope we're able to talk to the province about and see if we can make amendment around that. It's critically important to this future success of our city. Not, not, it's not, this is not just about housing starts and density. It has to be making our city work for everyone. Um, Anyway, I don't know if you have any, uh, sir, I, I should have asked the, the last Yeah, the CAO, we'll let last. the CAO speak to that piece about working on amendments and things. Uh, so we are working through discussions on amendments based on what was tabled and what was in our submissions provided to law amendments yesterday. And uh, I would say we'll know by the end of the week whether we're successful or not and will inform council accordingly. Um, with respect to your questions regarding what um, changes to fees or charges that were in the works or motions of council that will be impacted by this, I'm going to start the answer, then I'm gonna invite Jacqueline or the Halifax water staff who are here to come forward in case they have any that need to be disclosed. But for us, the things in progress, the increase to the building permits, I believe has already been implemented. The, um, our understanding is that where we have charges that have an established methodology, um, if we have to enter, enter new agreements using an existing methodology, that's okay. Um, but if we want to make changes to a, a development charge that's recovering costs, uh, um, a change methodology or change calculation methods, then that would be considered like a new item and we would require approval from the minister to do that. So we do have some new large master plan areas that are going to require CCCs. The Port Wallace um, area would be one. And um, we also have an outstanding motion from council to come back to look at establishing capital cost contributions to fund items such as libraries, uh, recreation facilities, fire and police infrastructure. And now I will invite Jacqueline or Kenda to fill out the answer. Who wants that, Jackie? 
Uh, I could start. Um, and just to confirm, um, we did, council did implement the building permit uh, fee increase. It was limited in scope, you will recall. Um, it had been uh, really decades since council had increased those fees and they still also remain highly subsidized by the taxpayer and it was done in a phased in man manner to respond to the concerns of industry. Um, around the financial risks, uh, the, you know, the implication remains for uh, we're trying to understand and work through, but the implication remains for those master plan areas for us to be able to recover those infrastructure costs as well as getting to really uh, a broader suite of um, partnerships as we look to other uh, impact of growth to, to other services and infrastructure because our program is fairly limited today uh, to water, sewer, transportation and uh, you know in particular areas it's not as robust or comprehensive as you would see in other jurisdictions so it's it's getting to some of those other softer costs that the CIO mentioned and maybe I'll turn it over to Halifax Water from there. Kenda. Thank you and uh, through uh, your uh, honor, your chair, mayor, to uh, the councillors. Um, Halifax Water, uh, Director of Regulatory Compliance Services, Kenda McKenzie, and um, our near-term impact uh, by not being able to increase our regional development charges, we have a clause that allows us to adjust for CPI annually at the start of every April, and for a two-year freeze, uh, a 2% 2 uh, increase projected for CPI, which is probably going to be higher. At a minimum, we're looking at uh, an impact to the wastewater CCC of 1.5 million and an impact to the water uh, RDC for um, half a million. And with that RDC, it was structured such that there would avoid rate shock. We're scheduled to go back to the Utility Review Board to reset that in 2025. If there is a shortfall, uh, it would be pushed forward to that next setting of the regional development charge and borne by the future developers. Uh, as uh, the CAO mentioned, we are looking at uh, Port Wallace. We would be looking at bringing a capital cost charge contribution policy forward to the Nova Scotia Utility Review Board near term. Uh, under this current rule set, we're unsure whether or not we'd be able to do that. And so that would have an impact on timing and everything with respect to that. And we are continuing to look into that to make sure whether or not we can do that or if we need minister approval to do so. The other factor is in our regulations, we have about seven uh, development related charges that are borne by the development community that are tied to connections and ability to uh, extend our systems. We are for planning to go forward with a general rate application in 2024 to the Nova Scotia Utility Review Board. And under this current rule set, we're uh, predicting that we would not be able to adjust those charges. And when we cannot adjust those charges, and we still incur that cost, uh, our concern is that the rate base would bear uh, the shortfall of any of those uh, development fees that we cannot adjust for inflationary purposes. All right, thank you, unbelievable, thank you. Thank you, you very much. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, really I'll, I'll be brief because I, I, I really am proud of my colleagues who took the time to speak at the New Laws, No Amendments Committee yesterday. Uh, it's, it was not only our, our, our colleagues here, but also community members and, and also some of the MLAs who spoke as well in favor of what we were saying and how this could be detrimental to our, our, our democracy as HRM. So again, thank you to the MLAs who tried to bring uh, some, some pause forward to have discussions with us. And again, at the New Laws, No Amendments Committee, you don't really get to see that happen. So, so uh, uh, you know, we, we, a few of us were in the, the overflow across the street, um, just watching uh, downstairs at Province House. So again, so yeah, in the cheap seats as Councillor. Uh, Mancini said. So I have one question and, and really a comment. So the comment that really wasn't talked about that that really bothers me about what what this bill is proposing to solve is the fact of building more housing. And we know, and it was mentioned a few times that the the, the you know the math is not mathing and the numbers are important. 
uh, me and a few colleagues here at the table had an opportunity to tour a uh, big development in the site, just to try to get an understanding of how that looks. And the owner of the development said, uh, in, and I've actually got this number from two other developers in the city, that is costing them an average $400,000 to build new builds with concrete. $400,000 a unit is pretty staggering when you consider what that means for large developments, even mid-size, if you're doing concrete. So, so to expect the private uh, industry to build affordable housing when they're already spending $400,000 a unit, it's just not gonna happen. And this bill is to build more housing, but it's not gonna be affordable. And it's really our role as, as government to support that. And, and Councillor Austin really spoke eloquently about the fact that why the density bonus program is so important because the private industry is just not gonna do that without support. And even with CMH 30% uh, median income, median income uh, uh, or 30% um, of market, that's still pretty out of reach for a lot of folks as well. So I just can't see how this would solve the affordable housing crisis that we're running into. The question that I have, and maybe Jacqueline, you can answer this, is just the logistics of what happens if the minister does approve a project? Because at the end of the day, it will come back to us and then our resources will be needed to kind of make it happen. So I'm just wondering if you can just help me and maybe anyone else is wondering what happens if the time comes when something is approved by the minister and now we have to kind of pick up the work to make that actually be a, a buildable project. And I guess the resources that might have to be shifted to make that work. Mr. Mayor, through you to the Councillor. At this stage, it's, it's really unclear uh, what the implications will be. I mean, we've hide it, highlighted mm -hmm. at a very high level um, some of the operating implications, but at this point, we don't fully understand because there will be regulations. It's my understanding there will be regulations that will follow the legislation that will provide greater clarity on, on how this will roll out, but there's no question that there will be implications for staff. Uh, we don't understand yet the, you know, the future role of staff on the panel, for example, but uh, there will be expectations. I would expect that staff are still continuing to support the work. Uh, so uh, the concern we would have would be around the predictability of of um, what could be coming. I mean, certainly we have a sense of what uh, what special planning areas, it's fairly well defined today what special planning areas that we're working on. So, you know, certainly a question for us would be to be able to understand what the resourcing expectations are on staff, how that might impact turnaround times, for instance, in terms of actually getting developments approved through the system and uh, as well as understanding how it impacts other initiatives in our work plan. Um, the suburban plan, for instance, is something that uh, council has identified as a priority. The completion of the regional plan, those are, you know, put, there are potential impacts there uh, once we understand the full scope of what's, what's been proposed. Thank you very much. The CAO Thank wants you. to just weigh oh, in yeah. too. Sure. Yes, I would like to add that if an event arises where the minister approves a development that council has rejected, um, the consequences would be that we are obliged to provide municipal services, right. you know, when that development happens to the um, residents that will be within that area. So the consequence would be a potential displacement of other priorities so we can adjust and accommodate our plans for that development that may not align with our long range planning and it will be additional costs. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I must congratulate those presenters yesterday, yourself included, Mr. Mayor and uh, the CAO and, uh, and the um, Councillors and the staff that made presentations, I watched it on uh, on television. I listened to it on the car, and, and I happened to listen to the, listen to the closure of the debate in the MLA's office, the Eastern Shores. 
So Harry Kent and I were sitting there listening to the rest of the debate finish, and I, you know, and I said to the MLA, I said, um, you know, what's the purpose of this legislation? He says he's to hurry up processes and improve uh, development, get more housing started. And I said, well, could you tell me what the application process is going to be? Who, where, who, who has to submit what type of plans, engineer drawings, you know, design layouts, and development, all this stuff? Who provides the infrastructure? Who provides the permits and the inspections? Couldn't answer those questions. So the question I'm going to be asking is what, will, what role will our building officials be having in this whole process? If a minister develop, approves the development, then where do we step in to make sure that everything is followed by the building code, design codes, where the case may be, to health act water standards, where the case may be, Nova Scotia power and nurse standards. I'm concerned about what is the liability of any future failures, structural failures. Because in the, in the legislation, the, the minister is wiping himself clean with the uh, injurious affection uh, clauses, so he cannot be held liable for any approvals of any development that may, may fail in the future. So who gets stuck with the bill? Does the municipality or, or has, the, um, has APENS, the Association of Professional Engineers of Nova Scotia, made any comments? Because I'm sure their certified bonding of all their engineers are going to have to worry about whether they're putting their name and stamp on something being approved by the minister, then I hope they're going to have the resources to stand behind it. Um, so that's the question I would have there. But I also said that uh, to Ken, I said, well, what about our other legislative amendments we've been asking for? You guys are way too slow. You know, we've been asking for amendments for a number of years now, and I said, uh, where is our things we want done? You know, we're trying to get things done we can't do, we've we got to wait on your schedule. We'll have to meet twice a year, maybe a couple weeks a year, if that. So I think that we need to uh, have an opportunity to discuss them with them. I, I sent a note to Kent here while well, debate here today because I also sent him the report last night as well as uh, Twyla Gross of the MLA for the Preston constituencies. I sent them both the report and I asked Kent to share it to, to, to with, um, with uh, Minister Lohr, which he has, has done. And, um, but the question will be is where do we go from here with the amendments going to Committee of the Whole? Uh, so, I don't know what dialogue is our staff having with the provincial housing officials. So I'd like to know, you know, where does our dialogue go from here in regards to if we if we can't uh, fix it, then how can we make it a little more tolerable in regards to what things we can work with within the legislation? You talked about some of the things we asked about for the uh, density bonusing in the in the other. Uh, Transition, transitional housing stuff. Uh, I think that we need to look at what ways we can make this bill at least somewhat effective for us, not against us. But uh, I'm really concerned about the process forward, is um, how it's going to unfold. Because I'm sure the development community would like to know okay, who do I make my application to? If, if, I'm t if it's taking too long for HM to go through its processes, can I expedite it to go to the minister? How much quicker will that actually be? What type of documents do I have to file? Because I can think of a few development plans in my rural areas I'll be pushing and said, perhaps, you know, there might be an opportunity to open the door on some of those rural plans instead of waiting for us to get eventually around to the rural areas. So I'll be uh, asking those questions. Thanks. Well, I'll, I'll go to the CAO on that. I just want to say that uh, we haven't had a lot of time to do this. Um, a week ago today we were uh, looking forward to the Housing Accelerator Fund announcement that we had got word we'd be getting because we were leading the country in uh, getting density uh, in our communities. Uh, but yes, uh, CIO, our lawyer, our planners have been very involved um, even since this went to law amendments. And uh, Kathy, do you want to just speak to that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. To the councillor's question, we have indicated as recently as today that once this bill is approved, we would like to sit down with the province and discuss what it means and how these processes are going to work. At present, um, our assumption is that the you know, building permit process, engineering inspections and occupancy permit process all applies as it does today to the developments. If a minister approves a uh, development and the municipality doesn't, we're not quite sure what that process looks like. And we're not sure what the intake process 
you know, or what our involvement might be um, if a project is going to the minister. So those are all details that need to be worked out. We do know, though, that the people who are going to live in these new developments are going to have an expectation that they're safe. So we have an interest in public safety, environmental compliance, of course, because of Health Act and our objectives there, and uh, impact to our, our existing infrastructure, our adjacent infrastructure or our new infrastructure that connects to our existing systems. And if Jacqueline or John want to add to that, John does, I think. Sure. John? So a couple of points, there was a lot in, a lot in your questions, um, Councillor, uh, through you, Mayor, to the Council. If the Minister accepts a project and allows it to go forward, essentially it deems a development agreement issued. And so that does not relieve developers of an obligation for the regular inspection process and for an occupancy permit at the end of the day. What it does is raise some serious concerns with respect to, you know, health and safety and the uh, and the services that might be required as a result of that, right? And so, uh, to your question with respect to, you know, what is now going to be open, our read of the legislation is that this legislation now provides three separate and distinct routes, as opposed to, you know, an appeal process or a veto with the minister that a developer can now determine where it is in their best interest to to apply. The minister directly, the executive panel on housing, or to the municipality. And while the minister has indicated he's not particularly interested in accepting uh, proposals, you know, that, that same could be said for council. Council may, may determine at some point, well, maybe you're better off going to executive housing. Maybe we don't pursue it. That's, that's not likely, but that is, that's a potential issue that comes out of all of this. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Councillor Diggle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> wow, so many questions and so little answers available to us at the moment. So um, I would also <clears throat> echo congratulations to the speakers at law amendments yesterday. <clears throat> I was in the cheap seats along with Councillor Stoddard, Councillor Purdy, Councillor Smith, um, even though on the video when you looked, you saw four empty seats, so we could have been there, but by design or default, there was some in my mind, disrespect given in that we weren't allowed over. So I would like to have that stated. Um, <clears throat> watching law amendments reaffirmed for me why I will never do party politics. Um, oh, it's not that bad, it's not that bad. It was terrible. <laughs> and it was an embarrassment to see an elected majority government sit there and not ask a question um, to actually have heads together making side comments, but uh, not giving the attention to the speakers that I saw at times. I, I felt that that was also rather disrespectful. Um, my grandfather would be pretty upset. He was president of the Conservative Party in Cape Breton for a while, and uh, he was one of the reasons that I thought uh, municipal government was good. He was never an elected official, because he said you had to follow the party leader, and so really good people yesterday in law amendments were silent and followed the leader and lost their voice to someone else, in my opinion. So uh, I take some uh, comfort in the fact that our CAO has said that there could be some amendments coming. Uh, so that part is really good. Curious that they use the phrase trusted partners for developers, but they don't use trusted partners as a mentality with other orders of government. I don't think that that is very good. It takes a long time for regulations to get done. What's gonna happen in the meantime? So that's a little bit scary for me. I'm really worried about what's gonna to happen to ratepayers at Halifax Water and to see what's gonna happen and how they write those regulations and what happens there. Halifax Water is already under an assault around the fees and the charges that happen. And so this government is now gonna add more angst to that if those things don't change. So that's really worrisome. The other thing that has me really concerned right now is, is this retroactive in any way? It is around the long-term care facility, I think, in one of the phrases. They said it will go back to January. But is it retroactive on any agreement or any development agreement that wasn't approved? I do know that uh, on the CBC, the minister referenced something in Fall River. If it is the development that I'm thinking that he spoke about, it was about a municipal planning strategy. 
and that it was defined as an opportunity site only if there was a secondary egress across a CN line and that was not approved and therefore it was denied. I hope that's not on his radar in a way because as Councillor Blackburn said in um, at Law Mounds yesterday, is like you're gonna have these developments that come through without any infrastructure. You're gonna build a bunch of apartment buildings where there is no transit, where there is no wastewater, where there is no water, where there are no schools that are available, where there is no land for schools available in the immediate area. So how is all of this going to happen? It just, again, reaffirms, I'm happy to be a municipal councilor where we do our work in public, where we are transparent, and where the public has an opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> That's very well said. I think Councillor Mancini made that point a little bit uh, yesterday too at law amendments. Uh, well done, Councillor. Um, Councillor Outhit. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, I'm gonna continue on a little bit where Kathy, uh, where Councillor Digger Gammon left off. I certainly do want to congratulate the folks who went there yesterday and how they conducted themselves, but I don't go to these things. Just like when I was first elected, the mayor and some colleagues wanted to grab placards and go down. And they went down, imagine, elected officials. For, former mayor, there. let's just... Uh, former mayor. Former mayor. mayor. Uh, to holding placards and, and uh, in front of our uh, legislation, leg legislature. And imagine how we'd feel if MLAs came and did that to us. What we did yesterday was too little too late because of the reasons that Kathy outlined. We know Steve and Brad are good people. They know probably that this is wrong, but they'd be kicked out of cabinet and caucus if they voted in favor of us. So I don't blame them. I blame the system. And if we are convinced that this flies in the face of the spirit of what Joe Howe and others fought for, let's do a court challenge. And don't tell me, no, they can do this under the legislation. I know what they can do under the legislation, but are they following the spirit and intention of the legislation? That is what courts decide, not lawyers at their table here and not us. If we're so upset, then put our money where our mouths is and challenge it. We threw the first stone. We threw the first stone, not the mayor, not the CAO, not the new director of planning. We threw the first stones by saying we should take over housing because the province is so bad at it. They haven't done anything in 30 years to build housing. We, we, we all responded to the people living in the parks and we blame the province because they are in charge of housing and community services. We around this table threw the first stone. And we get it back, we think, gee, they don't want good relations with us. The problem is they don't understand the difference between social housing and development. And that is where we get off track. So while some of us get angry, I almost just more like forgive them, they know not what they do. And I never liked density bonusing, I like inclusionary zoning. And the inclusionary zoning is what we should be trying to enforce and it may even mean that the levels of government have to put money into it. What we need to do is do what our CAO has indicated is happening now behind the scenes in my opinion, meet, educate, explain the difference, between housing and development, explain the harm and the costs to the CCCs, development fees and whatnot that we'll put on taxpayers. And frankly, if our taxes go up for the following reasons, let's put it right on the tax bill. This is going up to pay for the new road on Hammonds Plains Road to Sandy Lake because we're no longer allowed to do the CCCs if that happens. But let's try and make sure they understand why they can't touch the CCCs and the downside of doing that first through the communication. And frankly, folks, in addition to throwing the first stone, we have taken too long to do things. There are things to come to community council. Five, 10 years in the making. Five, 10 years. 
And Kathy, you mentioned how we're waiting for, uh, the CAO, you mentioned how we're waiting for an updated report, an outstanding report on the CCCs. I've been asking for that for 15 years. Because I needed a library, I needed a fire station, I needed a community centre in West Bedford. When are we going to be able to get the CCCs to do more? 15 friggin' years and we're still waiting for the report. Before your time. So some of this we have brought on ourselves. Some of it they just simply don't know what they're doing. But they're, I call it the Ford Compact. They're trying to do what they do in Ontario. Follow the big guy, the Ford Compact here. Make us look like the bad guys when we're not doing it to ourselves. And try and get some shovels in the ground. So let's educate them. Let's make sure we are doing things faster, if it means hiring people, if it means software, if it means doing more that we've, like what we've done, trying to do more as of right by doing center plans and HRM by designs, et cetera. The regional plan, five year review, took longer to do than the five years it was in, in effect. And we wonder why people criticize us for being slow. We have to change our ways too. But the best thing we can do as a council is let our mayor, let our CAO, let our government relations people do their jobs so the next time, if there is a next time, we don't have to go down to law amendments and waste our time. The mayor doesn't get a cryptic text the day before. We know what's coming and we educate them like we're doing now beforehand rather than retroactively. And we councillors, we can help with that by using our diplomacy like the mayor uses, like the CAO uses and whatnot, to try and educate them because they do not know what they do. Thank you, Councillor Morris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, if, if, if this was done through ignorance, then I think we need to do something to protect our residents from the costs, which could come in the form of tax increases. Um, it's, it's going to be a cost for the municipality in terms of time, uh, money for the municipality, staff energy, what we're able to proceed on through uncertainty. I'm concerned about delays with the suburban plan. I think it's very important that we move on with that so we can get good developments in suburban areas like the one I represent. So I'd like to know what our, um, I, I, you know, I, I struggle with how to amend legislation that I'm, I'm really opposed to um, that may have been done in ignorance, um, that, that has certainly been done in a way that is unfair to the municipality and by blindsiding us. So what are our legal options, if any, um, to oppose this legislation rather than amend it? So, look, to be frank, to date, we've spent an, an inordinate amount of time going through trying to determine the implications clause by clause and to work through that. So there is work to be done to take a look at it where it goes, generally speaking, municipalities are a creature of the legislature and we are bound by the legislation that passes. One of the biggest challenges on this obviously has been this lack of consultation and it relates to us now trying to, you know, go back over this to try and convince people to reconsider before it's too late. And so that's the importance of it. What, what I see is one of the biggest challenges in this, frankly, is that, you know, and I've been a student of government, you know, since high school, is that the legislature, or sorry, the government today seems to have a view that they will be the government going forward forevermore. And so when you devolve, and, and, I, and I, you know, look, I think every government feels the same way, to be frank. Yeah. And so the challenge for a legislature is understanding that governments come and go, and to devolve significant power into the hands of one individual, a minister, without having the opportunity for the public through, through municipal councils, through others, to see these sorts of changes as they're being done and debated, even with law amendments being the imperfect vehicle that it has, it, it's required to be done in public and, and it's bedded in legislation. And so the administration, the government of any particular day is bound by it. By moving these sorts of things into the minister and, and asking the public and the legislature itself to trust the minister of the day is frankly asking a lot. 
and I understand you you get that. I'm not sure that the government of the day or even the opposition pol politicians understand that the power in the current minister's hands may not be welded in a way which impacts us. I'm more concerned, frankly, about 6, 10, 15, 20 years from now when there is no requirement to come forward to have that discussion with council and, and et cetera. And so, yes, we will look at this long way around it. We, we'll have to go back and take some time now that, you know, the dust is settling to see what it is that we can do. And there may be some options. I don't know. Okay, but we could oppose the whole process that has unfolded here uh, rather than just amend certain sections. Well, I think, I think you've been doing that and in terms of the presentation you and your colleagues have made it at law amendments and we've been very clear about the challenges we have with the entirety of the bill. And so it's now up to the legislature as to whether they proceed or not or whether in fact they take some or all of our suggested changes and the conversations that come forward. It's not in our hands. But we could challenge it through the charter, through the courts. I, as I said, those are at this point that uh, we have we got people starting to look at some of that stuff. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have some questions for uh, for Jacqueline. I'm just wondering. Um, so, what is the current uh, permit? time right now. So if uh, you want to go in and build a, a house as of right, uh, how long does it take to uh, get a permit to send you on your way? Uh, also confirming, I've heard that there are some 200,000 units that could be built as of right at this moment. The land is owned by the proper people, it's zoned for the proper thing, and all that is required is for somebody to come in and apply for a permit. And just confirmation that even with the recent increase in our fees, our permitting fees are still among the lowest, last I heard it was like second lowest in Canada. Jacqueline? Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor. Uh, first of all, your, I think your first question was around the timeline for permitting for mm -hmm. a single family home. And uh, uh, my understanding is we are, uh, our target is set at 14 days right now and we're tracking under that, but certainly staff can correct me if I'm off base on that. Um, and uh, sorry, I forgot your second question. If you could just repeat uh, that one for me. 200,000 units that uh, could be built as of right at this moment. The land is there, it's owned by the right people, and all that is required is somebody to come in and pull a permit. That is correct. So we do estimate uh, far in ex excess of 200,000 is uh, have been up zoned through the regional center and through our other efforts um, to allow for uh, as a right development. So that capacity exists today. All right. And even with the increase uh, that we voted in last uh, budget, our fees are still among the lowest in Canada? That is correct, yes. Um, I think uh, last, last we heard, I think Prince Edward Island was the only province that had uh, fees that were lower than ours. Um, all right. That sounds like uh, a municipality that's got its house in order. Um, I, I'm not seeing any barriers there for developers to come and, and get a permit and do what needs to be done. Um, and I just, you know, I just read this morning on all Nova Scotia that there are some developers out there that think this bill hasn't gone far enough. I, I'm not sure how much more can be done to set the table for, for those who are the experts in building to come in and do what needs to be done. Um, my apologies if, uh, if uh, some of this sounds very familiar to uh, what I said yesterday, but I think it's important that uh, it be on the record here at, uh, at this body as well. Um, you know, I came to council in 2016 and certainly went into this knowing we exist at the pleasure of the province. 
didn't think for a moment that we existed at the whim of the province because that's what this feels like. Um, I don't see any data to back this up, this legislation up. I see no proof that this bill will create a single unit of housing or speed up the process further than what it is right now. Um, you know, we've just had it confirmed. We can turn out permits in 14 days. Uh, our fees are still among the lowest in Canada. Certainly doesn't seem like a barrier to construction, unlike things like high interest rates, labor shortages, the cost of concrete, as uh, Councillor Smith just pointed out. All those things HRM has no influence over. And now we're in a position where development can be greenlit for anybody, any place, and all that's required is a trip to the minister's office. That is not democracy. When it takes place behind closed doors, sorry, that's not democracy in my books. I think, you know, we're at a position where we're so focused on fixing one problem that we're on the cusp of creating an even bigger one in the process. Uh, this bill is, is not going to build communities, it's just going to build structures. And that's my biggest fear. The growth without the infrastructure support can be dangerous. And, you know, certainly as I outlined at law amendments yesterday, the ramifications on the community of Beaverbank, for one, uh, could be far reaching. You know, we've already made it to the list, a provincial list, by the way, of communities that are really at risk of wildfire. And, you know, even with uh, a pause on development in the Beaverbank area, we still have as of right development taking place to the tune of five apartment buildings and a 250 house uh, uh, subdivision. You know, Beaverbank Road is at capacity. And, and now we're in a position where anyone can swoop in, buy a lot, and build whatever they want as long as they make that trip to the minister's office. Um, you know, and I'll just finish up by saying if you were to drop by the tent community outside our doors right now and speak to the residents, I'm sure that they will tell you that permit fees, a housing task force, or a developer nexus card is not going to, is not going to get a roof over their head. An apartment with rents tied to their income is what they need and that's not our business. We don't have the ability, the authority, or the funding to do so. And I just, you know, my biggest fear is that this bill is not going to house people any faster. It's going to take time for much of what this bill enables to become reality. And even then, there's no guarantee that those who need the housing will be able to afford it. Uh, you know, I think the province has to sit down and come to a realization, and they have to decide. Is housing a human right or is housing a commodity to be bought and sold? Because these two philosophies are colliding. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well Thank you. I think it's a um, sign of how serious this is that Councillor Blackburn went dramatically over her time. I don't think, I don't, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't, that does not happen. And I was not going to interrupt you, so. <laughs> I want to say a word and then we'll go back again. So what I would say is, you know, until Thursday afternoon, last week was the best housing week we've had in Nova Scotia and in HRM, maybe ever. We had announcements of much needed affordable housing. Um, it could be considered a drop in the bucket, but it was significant. Um, and it was the result of a lot of really good staff work between our folks and the provincial folks and DCS and other departments. Um, it was, uh, and the work of this council and, and the uh, advocacy. Uh, we had the Housing Accelerator Fund, uh, which will provide over the next four years, $80 million. Um, and in the announcement of that, we were one of the first cities, London, uh, Calgary, a few other, couple others, one of the first cities to uh, reach agreement with the federal government and we were cited as an example of how to build housing, how to increase density in a community across the country. And then uh, the hammer fell on um, Thursday afternoon. Um, yeah, I was there when 
as Councillor Smith indicated, a developer, many, one of many I've heard, uh, Councillor, who've said it's over $400,000 a unit right now. I remember John Tory telling us a year and a half ago, it's unaffordable to build affordable. Um, so it has to be done deliberately and purposefully by provincial governments with support from uh, federal government. There will be, in every city in this country and probably in the continent, there will always be some developers who are cranky about something. If they aren't, then we're not doing our job. Um, because we are here to approve development, but not all development. We're here to approve good development. Uh, Councillor Outhit mentioned to throw, throw the first stone. I, I don't think I'd agree with that. I appreciate his point of view, but um, that was in reaction to not being able to get action out of provincial governments because there hasn't been a provincial government that has taken housing seriously in this province for 25 years. And we've had all three major parties um, at the helm. So we have things like the center plan. It takes a few years. And it enabled 37,000 as of right developments and 24,000 more in growth notes. Um, in a community that would normally um, see the construction of, I don't know, Kate or Jacqueline, 3,000 units a year, that's 20 years work, basically making things as of right. And that is what caught the attention of the federal government who said, you know what, that's what we need in other cities across the country. Um, the, to, to the point that somebody made, it might have been Councillor Blackburn, it might have been Councillor Outhead, I can't recall, data. Like, honest to God, there was a time that we had policy-driven data, not data-manufactured policy uh, in this country, um, because there are the numbers. I've, I've never heard, we've, I've used, I, I'm not going to, look, I've spoken on this in the last five days more than enough, but there are 11,000 residential units approved right now, 4,000 of which are not being constructed. Why aren't they being constructed? Interest rates, labor, supply chain. There are 61,000 through the center plan alone. There are these 250,000 residential units enabled, and that doesn't include a number of our, that doesn't include suburban plan and all the other things that are yet to come. Now, I go back and forth with people on that, but what I hear from the development community is, and what I heard uh, Councillor Smith and Councillor Cleary, who was with us last week, was a pretty significant developer in this community saying, what I need from the province, build affordable housing, and we can do the rest of it. And they can work with the city to do that. Two years ago, when the provincial government was elected, having said very little about housing during the campaign, I wrote all the party leaders a letter saying we need action on affordable housing. Um, they set up the executive panel on housing. Didn't like it. But you know what? My gosh, we put our back into it. Kelly Dante and Peter Duncan, who's here, Peter. Kelly Dante, who's gone to a better place, retirement. Uh, worked so hard on that, on top of everything else they were doing, and they were supported by Kate and Julian at the time and so many uh, others. Um, that was their idea, it wasn't ours, and now they've come in and said, okay, so you can go through the city or you can go through our executive panel on housing, or the third option is come to the minister and sit in my office and tell me what your solutions are. So. There's just not a lot that really can be said. We do have to make the best out of this that we possibly can. And you know what, folks? What people are looking for is a mature response to an immature action. We have to be mature. We have to go ahead with what we have. We have to fight it. To Councillor Morris's point, this is terrible legislation. Terrible legislation. It's not based, as I said, it's not based on fact. It doesn't answer the problem it proposes to fix. And it could be dangerous, not only to people who aren't housed, but to every taxpayer as well. And I don't like to use the word taxpayer very often um, because you don't have to pay taxes to be a citizen in my eyes. But those of you that pay taxes, your taxes would have to go up as a result of this. So anyway, it's a problem. Uh, we can go back and forth on it, but I think we, we're gonna have a very important discussion upcoming on homelessness. Connected, absolutely, but we're going to hear information on that that's going to uh, scare us uh, as well. Even though there's some promising things, and Councillor Mancini uh, and I had a little discussion with some folks this morning, there's a lot of hopeful things. But you know what? For heaven's sake, in the world today, man, talk to each other. Talk to us. Talk to us. Come and talk to us about what the problems are and get the facts. It's math. 
Legislation won't fix this. Math could fix it. But a goodwill and an ability to talk to each other, to figure things out together instead of just blindsiding each other with this stuff. Um, because when you blindside another order of government, you're blindsiding the citizens. That's the issue. It's not us, not my ego or your ego. It's the people who need us to work together to find solutions. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and well said. Um, I just wanted to, well, there's two things I just kind of want to wrap up on. Um, the first is the idea that we need to educate them. Um, this isn't a mistake at this point. This is the third time they've done this to us. This is routine habit practice of this government now. Um, and the second time they did this to us, they had the lesson. It was right there for anyone to see, which was uh, they rushed forward legislation because they had some erroneous information that our noise bylaw was suddenly going to grind construction to a halt. And then they didn't use it because once they actually found the facts and talked to industry in a meaningful way rather than just the handful that is whispering in someone's ear over there, uh, suddenly they realized, oh, actually there's not a problem here, so we're just going to carry on. And evidently, from that experience, nothing was learned. Because here we are, yet again. So they won't talk to us, and they haven't. You know, maybe the third time will be the charm, we'll see. Um, why? Well, to be totally crass about it, to me, part of the problem is they've concluded they don't need us. There's no votes in the city for them. Very few, anyway. Um, they can form a government without the city, which is a really horrible way to be setting up to run a province, to be, you know, that remote from the, such a major source of wealth and population in this, in this province. Uh, it takes two to tango, but we have not had a dance partner. We've had a dance partner that's more interested in a couple of uh, disgruntled developers than they have been in us. I think uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon said it well in terms of we are not being treated as a trusted partner here. We need to change that, but it's going to take two to change that. I think council's more than willing to change that. This is not productive for us. It's not productive for them. But we need two. So we need some hearts to change down the hill. Uh, the piece I wanted to, that I really buzzed in to, to just wrap up on, because I've been so focused on the affordable housing piece. Um, but I really want to take it a step further on the democratic piece, um, because Councillor Mason inspired me with his Joe Howe references. Um, there's other things that are part of Nova Scotia's political history. Uh, there was a time you bought votes with rum. There was a time to get government contracts. Uh, you had to fill the party in power's bank account. There was a time, and you know, and that was for liquor or toilet seats. There's any number of political scandals in our province's history. So to pretend that you know such risks don't exist in our system, right, would be naive. Those are the risks of human beings, unfortunately. And if you're designing institutions, you should have that in mind. You should not be creating a system that actually invites human weakness by concentrating power in the hands of one individual who gets to make a decision completely in private with no public accountability and no transparency with millions of dollars at stake. I don't think King Lore is corrupt for a moment, but this, is going, this legislation will exist well beyond him. And it would be naive of us to discount the risk and danger to the fundamentals of democracy that are created with a system that's being engineered in this way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well said, Deputy Mayor. So, uh, you know, I was, uh, Mr. Mayor, while you were speaking, I was thinking about the esteemed Rick Howe and how he would say, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. And I do think that it's extremely important for all of us to ensure uh, that our residents understand what's happening here through our social media, through our newsletters, um, to help get the word out uh, about what what this legislation means to them. Uh, in my remarks yesterday at Law Amendments, I raised my very serious concerns about the lack of consultation 
for African Nova Scotian communities. We've worked so hard in Upper Hammonds Plains to amend the land use bylaw to work towards a healthy, more productive community that would have longevity. Uh, African Nova Scotian communities have, ha they haven't had time to respond to this legislation. Um, you know, it is very uh, weird and poorly written legislation, so it's, I, I can understand why it's taken a lot of time for staff to be able to go through this and, and fully understand that, but in Upper Hammonds Plains, we've got over 750 building permits, uh, units in the works right now on a road with a dead end. Um, putting more uh, healthcare facilities uh, in communities that are already compromised is not good government. Um, it is unsafe. And I think, as I said yesterday, that they, ab like, we know that they know that municipalities are not the barrier to housing. Uh, there are development pro projects all across the municipality that aren't moving forward, uh, all across the province that aren't moving forward because of the challenges uh, that developers face. And so I am going to challenge our solicitor uh, because, it, it, you know, I think that it's really important for us to understand that senior government uh, in 1998 uh, clearly made uh, an out uh, for municipalities when Section uh, 519 states that the minister shall notify the Union of Nova Scotia Municipalities, which is now the Nova Scotia Federation um, of Municipalities, at least one year prior to the effective date of any legislation, regulation, or administrative action undertaken by or on behalf of the government of the province that would have the effect of decreasing the revenue received by municipalities in Nova Scotia or increasing the required expenditures of municipalities in Nova Scotia. So I am asking the solicitor under Section 519, does that not mean that this legislation is completely out of order? Mr. Mayor, through you to Council. So as I said before, we've been focusing on the sections, including the sections within this bill, which talk about, um, you know, the, the requirements for uh, consultation. And so, yes, we'll be back to Council once we've had a chance to assess some of that. And I'm not prepared to answer that today. Well, it seems to oppose what the Municipal Government Act uh, is absolutely. actually Absolutely. It, it, you, you. Are, you are correct in what you have read, as well as the components in the Charter with respect to the Minister's general duty to consult. This is not consultation um, to, um, to let us see the actual amendments and, and what they, they do um, once it's been tabled in the Legislature. You know, the obligation is, is in the charter to, for the minister to mm -hmm. consult with the municipality um, on any proposed amendments is the wording in, in our charter. And, yep. you know, so clearly they haven't done that. They're mm -hmm. not following their own legislation. Thank you. 100%. Okay, listen, there's no recommendation on the floor. Uh, I would say if people are, are, are watching this and they're confused by this and, and they want a sort of middle voice uh, on this. I would encourage uh, the listening of uh, Tom Urbaniak <coughs> on Information Morning, um, political scientist uh, from uh, CBU, I think, uh, who I thought had a very even-handed uh, take uh, on it um, and um, only bettered by the mayor of Halifax on Friday morning on the same show. All right, colleagues, we have no, uh, we have no other a recommendation on the floor. So thank you for the conversation. Thank you, uh, Kathy. Jacqueline, our new Director of Planning, you came in at a very quiet time in the history of planning in the province. We appreciate you. Kate, as well, of course. Thank you and to all of our planners. And thank you to Halifax Water uh, for coming back uh, to be part of the discussion. We're going to move to the information item brought forward. Um, is there a presentation on this? Yes, there is. So this was brought forward by Councillor Russell. This is on the annual workforce report. And I think Britt Wilson will speak to this, Councillor Russell, and then we'll uh, have a discussion. The floor is yours, sir. Have you got a presentation or something that we need to put up? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mayor and Council, Britt Wilson, Executive Director of Human Resources. Um, thank you very much uh, for bringing forward this this item and allowing me to do a short presentation on on our report. Um, 
I think the clerk's got it up, but maybe not. It's not, yeah. There it is. Okay, once again, um, so this is a short presentation on, on our annual workforce report. Um, so we produce uh, an annual report profiling the workforce over the fiscal year. Uh, in 2023, there was a motion from council requesting additional information be provided in future reports. And we have taken that away and looked at uh, a variety of different improvements uh, for this report. And, we, and our reporting, um, function is maturing, as I'll talk about a little bit more in, in, in my presentation. Uh, for 2023, uh, we have um, added a demographic breakdown by business unit uh, into the report. Um, we've updated the uh, talent management uh, reporting to include the number of job postings and the number of candidates. Uh, the training activity uh, report outlines programs offered and delivered, both mandatory uh, and elective. Uh, and we've broken out the mandatory courses uh, by uh, mandatory for employees or mandatory for managers. Uh, we've uh, added back in the absenteeism information by business unit and the organization, uh, including total hours and a dollar value component to that. Uh, sick time has been broken out uh, in paid and unpaid. Uh, sick time. Uh, we've broken out the workers' compensation claims provided by policy groups. So workers' compensation allocates uh, different policies to different uh, sections of our organization and prices it accordingly. Uh, we've also broken out voluntary turnover by business unit uh, to help um, dive into that a little bit more. And we've also included the overtime by business unit uh, and as an organization including total hours and dollar value. So those are some of the enhancements we've built into this year's report uh, that you would have seen. Based on some questions uh, we have received from councillors, we, uh, in my uh, presentation here, I've, I've taken a little bit of a deeper dive on some of the, the charts that you would have seen in the report. Um, particularly around uh, turnover. So I know that uh, turnover has been a concern for many of our business units. It's obviously a major concern for us in HR. Uh, and we've been breaking, we've provided uh, a breakdown here, which uh, gets into a little bit of the differential in the kinds of turnover we've seen. So more, uh, most importantly, we talk about resignations, uh, the resignation percentages, uh, retirements, obviously, a slightly different um, turnover number, as well as uh, voluntary and involuntary departures. So we didn't have involuntary departures built into the prior, uh, into the reporting, uh, and the void there sort of left the question to say well, how much of our departure is voluntary versus involuntary. So uh, on the chart I have here, you'll see that our involuntary turnover percentage is, is an extremely small component of our turnover, so 0.58% uh, uh, for this year. And as you can see, it's fairly consistent over the past five years in terms of, of the level. So the, the turnover we're seeing is really in the involuntary, so that's people departing to work for someone else and or um, retirements. I also have here uh, the same chart, but broken out by business unit. So uh, just giving a little bit more uh, in-depth uh, view on what's happening uh, in our various services. Um, so again, uh, showing those um, resignations uh, as a percentage, as well as the numbers, the retirements, again, uh, the voluntary turnover and the involuntary. Involuntary, of course, being uh, a very small component of the overall. Uh, the percentage may look larger in some business units that are quite small. So if you have a very small business unit uh, that has one involuntary, it might look very large in terms of the percentage. Um, we don't provide the exact number of employees by business unit simply because we're, there's a concern of, from a privacy perspective that that might be an identifier. So we're simply providing uh, a percentage of, the, of the, um, the turnover within a particular business unit that 
is attributable to an involuntary uh, turnover. So in 2023, uh, as a number, we saw a total of uh, 337 employees voluntarily leaving the organization with the highest number being uh, in, in Halifax Transit. So that's a combination of employee resignations as well as retirements, uh, and Halifax Transit was 157, uh, and Halifax Regional Police was uh, the next highest with uh, 47. Further breaking down uh, on the same theme, we have um, some information here on internal movements. So we did provide information in the base report. Oh, oh I'm so sorry, my apologies. That was the business unit one. Didn't see this one, so I'll go back and just highlight those again. Uh, here we have the breakdown by business unit. So as I, as I mentioned, that involuntary turnover percentage might seem large, but it's for a very small business unit. Uh, and it, for some business units, it's quite small, it's zero. Uh, the key numbers being that um, resignation and retirement component, the highest one being uh, Halifax Transit, uh, and, then, uh, and then police. So just getting a little bit more of a different view on, on our turnover uh, across business units and across the organization. So another breakdown we provide in the in base report, we talk about uh, our hires, um, the number of hires. Uh, and so we've, uh, based on some questions, we actually looked at uh, how many of those hires are what we, were, what we would call internal movement so versus an external hire. So here you'll see a breakdown of the kinds of um, assignments that, uh, or the kind of hire that you might see, acting assignment, development assignment, um, filling vacant permanent position, vacant temporary position, uh, job change or lateral movement and promotion, and then broken down between permanent employees, so the one column shows permanent employees and other would show uh, that's going to be students, um, temporary employees, uh, crossing guards, seasonal positions, uh, recreation programmers. So um, those would be the, the other category of employment. So as you can see here that in 2022-23, uh, a significant number of our uh, total hires, which uh, were 1525, there were 1525 total hires, in 22-23, uh, 685 were internal movements, a combination of uh, other uh, temporary employees and 596 permanent employees uh, changing jobs, uh, with the residual being uh, 840 uh, positions being filled with external hires. And I have that breakdown here uh, on the next slide. So again, you'll see uh, the other category and then the permanent employee category and as to be expected you know casual positions recall seasonal and student positions are being filled by that people in that kind of employment status and are filling vacant uh, positions permanently are, are, is happening with permanent employees so again um, with respect to external hires and rehires, we have three, 354 um, permanent positions hired uh, from external applicants. And then 485, uh, sorry, 355 permanent and 485 uh, temporary or casual positions filled um, with external hires. And then my final slide, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, the work that we're doing to enhance reporting for council and for our business units uh, going forward. So on this slide um, uh, is displayed what we've developed as the work for, workforce dashboard. So based on the recommendations from council uh, from the last process, we took that away and started to work at some automated reporting. And uh, in conjunction with our IT team, with uh, uh, HR has been working to develop this dashboard. And 
This dashboard will be available quarterly and available to all councillors uh, through the intranet. Um, and you'll see this is a static image, but it contains uh, some of the basic um, workforce information, including um, total departures, average age, average service, the headcount, uh, retention and turnover metrics, including new hire retention and turnover, which is something that we've been providing to the business units most recently. It, it sort of gives us a, a temperature check on uh, are we retaining people who new hires uh, or are they leaving and where. This, uh, like I said, this dashboard will be available to council uh, quarterly uh, through the intranet and uh, there, it has a breakdown by business unit as well. Uh, so if any of you would like more information on how to access this or how to navigate that, please contact my office and we'll have someone come out and, uh, and give you a demonstration of, that, of this. And this, is a, this dashboard is being provided to each of the business units and will be available to council quarterly. And with that, I'm prepared to take questions on the base report or... Thank you, Brett. I think what I'm gonna do is take a, take a break. There's a couple of people that wanna to speak to this, so if you're okay, I hate to make you hang around. I know you're a high-priced, uh, important guy, but if you can give us 15 to 20 minutes, uh, we'll come back at 3.20. Colleagues, okay? Thank you all. Thank you, Brett.
Does anybody know what happened to council while I was gone? All right, I think we should um, take advantage of the fact that we're almost 10 minutes past the time we would do to come back and begin. Uh, Councillors are straggling in. I fully and completely blame uh, Paul Russell's wife for that. I understand that she brought in uh, pies. They went up and they collected some apples and some butterscotches in the valley and turned them into pies and nobody bought any to the mayor. But everybody up, I hope everybody will come back when the time comes. Having said that, I'm gonna go to Councillor Paul Russell. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the report and thank you for uh, the presentation this morning. When I saw the report initially, um, I was remembering the report from last year and I was very specifically keeping an eye out for certain things within the report, certain telltale signs that let's, let's see how this is going to go. Um, and there were some things in the report that gave me pause. Uh, one of the ones at the very beginning is when it mentioned that it was based on HRM's people uh, plan, which was outdated last year. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that next year it'll be based on something else. Um, but a couple of, and, and I appreciate the conversations that we've had. Uh, a couple of things that I was looking for were absolutely in the, uh, they weren't in the report, but they were in the presentation today and, and I'm, thrilled to see them in the presentation. One of the things that we should be able to do is take a year, a number of years ago, add together the hirings and take away the departures and that's the size of the organization. And I pointed out last year uh, that because we didn't have the breakdown of internal versus external hirings and we didn't have the involuntary departures, um, that we weren't able to do that. I used different words this year, it's a little bit better. Um, the other thing that I was looking for last year with the internal and external hires, I, I was looking to see how, how many more people we were bringing in from outside. The external hires is a really significant number. One of the reasons for that is if we only hire internally, we will do nothing to increase diversity. Um, and, and by having a, high, a higher number of external hires, uh, we will be able to increase diversity. And so if I understand the, chart, uh, the, the, the um, table that you showed us correctly, 354 permanent employees were uh, hired externally. That is fantastic. Um, hopefully that and the involuntary departures uh, would make their way into future versions of this report. I am thrilled with a lot of the rest of the information that I see in this report, um, and I'm hoping to see it mature over time. Is there anything that we as council can do or should do or need to do to enable a more full set of demographics to come forward, uh, a more full set of statistics to come forward uh, in the report for next year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question, <laughs> uh, Councillor, uh, through, through the mayor to the Councillor. Um, actually, there is, and, and I was just discussing with the team, and there's something I forgot to, to update in my report. So one of the aspects of the um, the dashboard which I mentioned at the end of my presentation, which will be available for council to see. It will be available for you to see every day. It'll just be updated quarterly. But we have actually several phases of improvements planned already for that dashboard. So incorporating new pieces of information. So as you become more familiar with looking at that dashboard, if there's pieces of information that you see or that you would like to see, we would welcome you to reach out to us to talk about how we might incorporate that into the dashboard and or into the report in the future. So the idea of the dashboard is to give you a little bit more of a timely sense of what's going on in the workforce that may 
give you more uh, information to ask questions, uh, and we will be able to respond to that more quickly than the once a year report. Uh, we, we encourage more of a dialogue if there's pieces of information that you're interested in seeing, which we would then roll up into the final report on an annual basis. So, and I do uh, thank you for the comment about the people plan reference to the language. Uh, when I was reviewing the report, I do see that it's in the origin statement, so I think that's actually a verbatim from the council direction, um, and so we may just change that into going into the future uh, in the origin space. Just re referencing the council note. Um. Okay, thank you very much. I do appreciate all of the work that has gone into it. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, uh, Britt, you introduced me at the break to uh, the new Britt Wilson, your successor. Would you introduce her to uh, council? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, so, uh, Mayor and Council, I'd like to introduce Rochelle Belmare, who is the new Director of Total Rewards uh, in for HRM, my former position, and we welcome Rochelle from Halifax Water, where she uh, has spent many years and is f very familiar with our structures. <laughs> All right, she's come in from the wilderness, not the first one. And uh, so she's the director of Total Rewards. So if you want a scene card or something like that, we would go to, go to her and I, get that. Sorry. Yeah, can I ask Kathy perhaps to say a word? She's probably familiar. Uh, I wanted to make one comment on the uh, annual workforce report uh, and draw council's attention to something that I think council and the municipality should be very proud of and that it, that is the uh, statistics around employment equity. And if you look at those statistics, you will see that the percentage of employees hired from employment equity groups in the last year was 41.84%. That's a significant increase over last year. It's the highest it's ever been in the last five years. And I think it's a very positive thing for our diversity and inclusion objectives at the municipality. I'd also like to note that the number of diverse applicants or equity seeking applicants to our positions has also increased significantly over last year, which is a good thing. So thank you very much to the human resources team for all the work they've been doing on that. Thank you very much. Can, uh, Councillor David Gammon. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So that was one of my points, was looking at employment equity. So thank you very much, uh, Adam, Madam CAO. Um, and thank you for the report. It was a, a good read. I know when you're trying to take a full report like that and then figure out what do people want to see in a presentation, you know, there, there's a lot in the report that is great. Um, one of the questions I would have is, do we ever give stats on how many exit interviews are done as well as how many are offered, how many actually take up the offer to do an exit interview, and is there any trend that is identified in exit interviews, whether they be they're going to another job or even retirement. I was just wondering, is there a way to incorporate anything like that in the report, the annual report? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, through the Mayor to the Councillor. <laughs> The exit interview process has just been sort of revamped and is getting in, we're getting the legs under it. That's exactly where we want to go with the program is to try and start to collect that data to understand how to improve. We know anecdotally that our, the participation rate in our exit interviews is not high uh, to date. Um, and so we are, we are collecting what data we have and we're going to try and use that to improve. But it's certainly something that we could start to incorporate into future reporting. Thank you very much. And hi, Rochelle. Nice to see you again. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> okay, if there's no other questions, uh, Britt. Thank you very much. I appreciate the work that you do uh, very much for us. Colleagues, we're going to move ahead to 15.1 and reports under the CAO. This is a second reading on an amendment to a bylaw respecting a mobilization of vehicles on private property. I'm going to just pick a name out of the hat, but uh, Councillor Blackburn. <laughs> Wow. 
<laughs> harsh. This is harsh. <laughs> uh, all right. I move that Halifax Regional Council adopt bylaw V201, amending bylaw the V200 respecting immobilization of vehicles on private property, as set out in revised attachment B to the revised staff report dated September 19th, 2023. I so move. Second by Councillor Russell. Councillor Blackburn, anything on it? Uh, nothing really more on this. Uh, the report makes it uh, pretty clear, just uh, adjusting uh, some of the fees. Uh, but uh, yeah, just uh, looking to move this forward to uh, the next stage. All right. Ready for the question? Carries. Thank you, uh, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, 1512 has been passed on consent regarding asset names. 1513, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities annual conference and trade show bid. Hands up everybody that would like to see us uh, host that again, uh, by the way, here in uh, Halifax, because that was the best FCM ever. 1514, proposed amendments respecting partial tax exemption and to apply to commercial properties. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will put the motion on the floor. I move that Halifax Regional Council refuse to adopt the amendments to Administrative Order 10, the partial tax exemption administrative order. Second. Second, Councillor, who seconded? Uh, Councillor Blackburn. Blackburn, thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you so much. So it was really hard for me actually to say that motion because <laughs> it goes against every bit of my being. Um, this has been really hard on the businesses that were impacted by wildfire. I am going to ask you to vote against this so I can put on the alternative one uh, motion. I think it's important for us to understand obviously the, the implications to businesses. Um, certainly there's uh, business interruption insurance uh, that businesses uh, can apply for, but I, I want to remind folks that there's no buildings there. So, you know, th while there may be a business interruption uh, insurance for some of these folks, they have no place of business and they are paying full 100% uh, tax on these businesses that don't exist. So while I understand uh, the, the, the reasoning that staff have, have put in place, the fact that the uh, provincial government, which is in front of the legislature right now amending the Halifax Charter, knew that uh, HRM was requesting this w since June 2023 to actually have the ability to legally have the authority to grant a tax concession to a business. Section 71.2 prohibits that. Uh, so it doesn't matter what Section 87 says. Uh, what matters is what Section 71 says. Section 87 allows for tax re reduction for properties uh, damaged by fire, but it doesn't mention commercial. It is explicitly stated in Section 71 that financial assistance is not permitted to business or industry. So staff, thank you to our legal um, uh, support uh, and thank you to staff who've put this together. Um, I'm asking you to please vote this down so that I can put on alternative one to support businesses who do not have business interruption insurance and, um, and ensure that we are signaling once again to the provincial government that we would like to have an amendment uh, to the Halifax Charter. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. I'll be supporting what the councillor is asking for. I'll even go even further. I would suggest that it should be a, a damage to any property, be it residential or business or, or commercial, that it's damaged. How to be a wildfire? It could be a flood. Could be a landslide. Uh, if the property's been damaged, it's been damaged, and if the asset's no longer there. How can you be, how can we reasonably tax it? Um, you know, we we had some recent adjustments over the years to our property tax exemption policy to bring in homes that were damaged uh, or destroyed by, by other fires and floods and stuff. And I think this is just a, a reasonable, reasonable extension 
to include commercial properties, because even some residential properties that we have taxed and may have burnt whatever may have had a commercial component within the building of a small business. And you know, are they being excluded? I don't think so, because they lost residential homes. So I think it's been a natural progression to have this evolve to include all properties that have been lost by fire, not just the t upper 10 town wildfires, but any, any significant fire, could be a flood, be a landslide, whatever the case it be. If the property has been destroyed, I believe there's also provisions under the uh, Assessment Act that if property valuations, see there's a gross error in the rolls, whatever, they can go back and amend them if they wish to. But we know, I know we always have a static date of December 1st. Whatever asset was there on December 1st, that's what's going to be taxed. And um, I think that we should have some more fluidity in our legislation and allow for some uh, recuperation of loss, be it even a, a partial tax exemption, because the property's still there, it's just the building isn't. CAO on this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through to the councillor. I would suggest if you want to look at a, creating a new program or broadening this program that should be dealt with as a separate motion because it would have to go back for a staff report. And I want to ensure that this matter of the properties <coughs> impacted by the most recent wildfire get dealt with, you know, before the final tax bill comes due at the end of the month. <laughs> Um, with respect to broadening, if council wanted to look at that, I would remind you that we would have to try to estimate the financial implications, think about what constitutes destruction, but also would want to point out that even though properties, if they're partially destroyed or totally destroyed, they're still receiving municipal services. They're still receiving fire protection. They're still receiving police services, governance planning. And unfortunately, our um, municipal fiscal arrangement is such that 81% of our revenues come from property tax. We don't have any other means to set a recovery for the services that they would continue to receive. So we would have to carefully consider the impact of broadening this program. Just to rebut, I would say though is that there's only a partial exemption with the property still there. He's still taxing on the property, which is the asset itself being the building, the dwelling, office tower, whatever the case may be. That's the only piece that may be lost. So I think that um, they're still paying tax on part of the property. They're still providing you know access to services, but um, it's not it's not a, it's not a total freebie. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And so I just want to make sure I, I've got this straight. Um, the province is telling us, oh, you guys can do this, go ahead and do it. Um, but our opinion is legally we can't. That'd be correct. <laughs> well, that's a funny old place to be, isn't it? Um, so. I don't know, maybe we, I hate to say it, but maybe we need to go in camera to talk about some of the implications um, if we were to do this. Um, but maybe if defer. If I was going camera, if somebody moves that we go in camera. Well, I, I'm wondering if maybe could, uh, I'd move that we defer this to um, the in camera portion of our meeting rather than going in camera, coming back out of in camera and then going back in camera. Is there a second for that? So Councillor Austin is uh, suggesting we defer this till we go in camera and have further discussion. Agreed. Uh, everybody will have a vote on that. So that's carried. So we will bring that back in camera when we go in uh, camera. In the meantime, so thank you. Um, was there somebody there? No, no, okay. Uh, we will move then to our 1515, which is our homelessness strategy update. We have a presentation here from uh, Maxwell Smart Chauvin. <laughs> and I see our um, 
executive, executive director, community safety, director of community safety? Executive. executive director, sorry, I don't want to take an executive off you. Executive director of community safety, uh, Bill Moore of Dartmouth. The floor is yours, folks. Tell us it's all solved. I can't do that. I could lie if you like, but um, Mr. Mayor, Councillors, CAO, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, an update on uh, proposed homelessness strategy. Uh, I, we've talked a lot about the housing crisis that is uh, happening right now. We know in July the Sleeping Rough survey told us that we had 178 people uh, sleeping outside. Uh, street navigators now estimate that that is over 200, with 10 people a week becoming homeless, and in one case, uh, one of the navigators one week uh, identified 30 people who became homeless that week. Uh, the by name list is well over a thousand people, and uh, we expect the sleeping number to double in the next eight months, as it did last year from November until July, it went from 85 to 178, and we don't see any reason um, why that uh, won't continue again. And it is important to note, and we'll talk about this in a, in a couple of moments, but during last year, the province opened 360 beds between various projects. And so far, with the pallet shelter commitment and the tiny homes, we have about 150. So we do have less housing so far, or less shelter space so far coming online than we did last year. So it could be larger than that. Uh, updates on a couple of things. First off, a winter shelter. The province has committed to having a winter shelter. However, they do not have a location. Uh, they are in... Uh, negotiations with uh, one location that we hope will come together. We, uh, one of our staff uh, suggested another location that they're going to look at tomorrow. We need space for 80 um, or so people. Um, and at this point, without a location, there's not much more we can announce. In the end, if by the end of the week, if there is not a location, we w our intention is to take a recreation center based on the needs of, of the winter shelter uh, to provide that space. And we have talked to the province about standing up, whether it's one of the spaces they find or whether we provide something, a gradual upgrading of that shelter space so that we start with essentially what you would see in a crisis such as a hurricane, so cots, some assistance from Red Cross providers to get, to get as many people in as possible and then um, go forward from there, adding features as we go along. We also have, as it outlines in the report, already spoken to the province about the importance of this not just being a winter shelter. We need more shelter space. And so that we would like to see this um, continue on for a, 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 certainly a significant period of time. Uh, we also need to realize that there will be some who will not be able to go to the shelter, uh, possibly depending on location, uh, possibly also depending on who's running it and managing it, and interrelationships between people. So we will look at some other humanitarian supports we can provide for those. Uh, it, in previous years, the province has been able to stand up multiple shelters. So, for example, last year we had one in Halifax and one in Dartmouth. At this point, they believe they will only be able to stand up one, which means we don't get some of that benefit of having two different locations. Uh, this also is an essential element of our ability to reduce overcrowding. We need to be able to offer people other locations to go and better locations. Um, and so we certainly are concerned that we are still at this point in October without a designated location where people can winter, winterize. Uh, so far the weather has been cooperative, but um, we all know that won't last much longer and there will be a, a ramp up to get anything started. Uh, we have proposed in the report to designate some additional locations. 
uh, and we've put some suggested numbers that we would try and strive for. Again, these are not possible with the current number of people who are sleeping outside. So we need the winter shelter and some other options. But uh, we to look at allowing some tents in Grand Parade, right now there are over 20 and we would suggest reducing that to eight. Victoria Park, just the area around the fountain, so to free up the event space, to free up the walking trails, to free up where people do yoga and so on. The, uh, the berms on University Avenue, which are currently occupied by a couple of tents, but uh, to put a few tents on the first couple of them. Martins Park, which is located in Dartmouth, uh, is a fairly small space, but it is not next to residential. Beaufort Park in Halifax, which has been used in previous years, and uh, Saunders Park, uh, which we would use the this section down towards the church for approximately eight, um, eight spaces. Important to know that this is not enough designated space to shelter all the folks that we expect and location our way to a solution. Uh, we will have to be talking with the province um, and with council about other options. Uh, and you have provided direction previously at the September council meeting for us to look at a mass shelter option. And we hope to come back to you uh, later this year uh, with that report to go forward. Uh, in the provincial announcement that was made last week, they are purchasing 200 pallet shelters. I put a picture up because when we say pallet shelter, people think of shelters made with pallets. Um, and Councillor Russell was uh, pointed that out to me at some point. He says, I know what you mean, but very few other people do. So we've put the picture here, not only for you, but also for members of the community to see what these are. Of the 200 that they are going to provide, 100 will be put in other parts of the province. So for example, there are other municipalities ready to accept them now. Uh, 100 would be put here in HRM. Uh, you don't put them all together. We put them in groups of sort of 10 to 15, which is what Pallet Shelter recommends is ideal. And we would consider some of them as villages with a purpose. In other words, we might consider one that is dry so that people who are struggling with sobriety could go to one where there is nobody around them consuming um, alcohol or substances. We also might have one that's based on a harm reduction model for people that are. We could consider ones that are targeted towards seniors, ones that are targeted towards um, a whole variety of options, but so that we would create spaces that are more conducive to building community and provide people the types of uh, things they want. For every 10 units, they get a common space, which is another structure that goes in. And uh, on the next slide, I'll show you a picture of the inside, but they do not um, have washrooms. However, they do have power. They are winterized uh, and they are 10 to 12 weeks delivery. So at this point, we would expect them to probably arrive sometime towards the end of January with opening in February. They would, uh, they would be serviced by a service provider. So the province would contact a service provider to service one village, maybe two villages, but there will be various service providers for various villages. Uh, one of the pieces of our strategy is that we would bring on to our team somebody who would help coordinate between the villages, but also help coordinate um, who goes in, access, when people come out, where do they go, and all of those pieces that need to be done. The, uh, one of the other essential elements of this is an MOU with the province that very clearly will outline who is responsible for what, when, what happens in a year, and so on. And uh, Bill and I did meet with provincial representatives yesterday with some other staff, and they wholeheartedly agreed that they were, that was important and that they were uh, ready to engage in that process. Uh, even with 12 weeks delivery, that's three months, that is not a lot of time. So we will, we are already in, in starting of the planning stages 
to do that. The province has committed to provide some sites for them, and we have suggested other sites that would be possible for these shelters. Uh, we do have some surplus land that has been designated for affordable housing that we could use. These structures sit essentially on a flat surface, so they don't require us to do significant land modifications, and they literally can be picked up and stored afterwards. There is a parking lot that is zone J, which is at the corner of Bell Road and Sackville. Uh, so it's on one side of the Wanderer's Grounds. Uh, so that is a, is a flat surface that drains well. The uh, side lot of the Sackville Sports Stadium would be a possibility, and we'll come back to that in a moment. The Young Street lot of the Halifax Forum, we've talked about previously, but that could ho house some of them. And the Green Road encampment site in Dartmouth um, has a fairly large flat space that would be possible for them. Uh, so we would need to continue to look at those options. Uh, they also announced a tiny homes pilot. This is proposed for the, Cobb, the former correctional ball field in Sackville, which is currently a designated location. Uh, the, the tiny home has its own indoor plumbing uh, and power and so on. And uh, these are similar to structures that you would see at 12 Neighbors and other locations like that. The announcement included 50 units on this site. 30 of them will be ready by summer 2024 for occupancy, uh, based on the proposed timeline. A uh, not-for-profit will be structured to run that, set up by the province, and uh, initial conversations is that we would be one of the representatives on that not-for-profit. The province would provide them the funding for them to manage that. Uh, one of the other key pieces here will be a transition plan for the existing encampment residents. There are more encampment residents there today than we will have tiny homes. And uh, some residents may or may not wish to be in a tiny home or may or may not be suitable for that accommodation depending on their needs. So we don't have a lot of answers to that other than that's part of the plan. Uh, we also are planning to use Shuby Campground for some trailers. So you will see the, uh, the more intricate uh, pathways that are in the fenced area of Shuby Campground. They are very soft hills and grass and are not capable of supporting RVs on there. Um, and also tenting on there in the, the winter is problematic. So we're proposing and using the sites that are outlined in yellow, which is a roadway that leads down to the pump track, the ball diamond that's down there, and some parking that's used by people who take their dogs for a walk in the park. Uh, those sites are campsites. They are built for RVs. Um, because the campground is not winterized, there will not be water or showers available in the campground facilities, but many of the RVs have those services and they could collectively bring water in for their holding tanks and so on. Uh, we can provide power, it already exists there. We would plow that road as we do now, um, which is done by the park staff. It's important to realize though that it's not a paved road, so it can't be plowed to road standards. It's a, it's a gravel road to lead down to there, but we still can plow that so people can get around. And we will do this in partnership with the existing campsite operator. Um, and they wish to be involved because they wish to ensure the campground is good for future years and they know their site and they know, uh, they know what will work well there. So, as part of all of these, these pieces, what will HRM be contributing? We will contribute some locations. Uh, so obviously designated locations are ours, but we will contribute some locations to the pallets and the tiny homes project, which is on the Cob former Cobbequid ball field, is an HRM piece of surplus property. Uh, there will be some site preparation for the RVs and pallet shelters, mainly pouring a gravel to make the flat surface or to create some of that drainage that's necessary. Uh, that can 
primarily be done by our staff. So our staff have already confirmed today that the gravel for the RVs is relatively simple and that we can manage that internally. Uh, we'll provide the general municipal services of some snow clearing, grounds maintenance, and garbage pickup. And so we'll also participate in the design of these sites to help facilitate that. So for example, we would want the pallet villages to be set up as well as the tiny homes in such a way that we could clear the main sidewalk with a bobcat versus having to hand bomb it or things like that. Uh, and we have already, we had our first meeting about pallet shelters and tiny homes this week and we already have staff from John McPherson's shop involved so we have that expertise uh, at the table. We would bring on a full-time staff person who would assist us with the allocations, admissions, and operational support for the, uh, the pallet villages. This is essential as the pallet villages, which there could be six or seven in total, will be run by different service providers and there needs to be a COG that helps facilitate that, that also helps us ensure that people that can go in are prioritized for those, for example, who are living in parks and outside at this time. And if somebody isn't working out, maybe they need to be in a different village with a different focus. And again, we'll have a person who will have all of that knowledge, all of those connections and be able to fill, um, fulfill that. We have also committed as part of our, our existing work to do a lived experience consultation about these villages and about the pilot. We'll do it in partnership with the province. We'll have them join us. Uh, we have already created the first list of questions and things like that, but it is really important if we want people to see these as somewhere they want to go and if we want them to be successful, we do have to ask the people who are going to use them. They need some input. We need to hear about perhaps they have a unique prioritization for a village that they want to hear about that we don't know about. Um, and so we'd want, to, we'd want to get that input. We'd want to get input on how do we make community, how do we build it up, and, and those kind of things. Uh, there are obviously some risks. If we do not have a winter shelter, right now we have almost 200 people who have nowhere to go. And if you've been outside, you see they are in summer only tents. Uh, we have people building fires just to keep warm and uh, we, we will have people die if we do not have a place to go. Uh, the closure of a recreation space uh, also brings risks with it. We obviously most of our recreation assets are virtually full so we will not be able to accommodate everything in another location, though we do have some, some mitigation plans to, to help facilitate that. Uh, but that, that will come with challenges and hardships, some of it uh, borne by volunteer groups and things like that. Uh, if we choose not to have to play that coordinator role, it is entirely possible all of these spaces could be filled by people on the by name list, but not a person who's sleeping rough, which is why this is so important. Uh, there are some environmental concerns with any habitation, which is why we've involved John McPherson's shop already, so that as we start to look at sites where the pallet villages could go, we can assess those, those pieces. And for the tiny homes pilot in Sackville, we've already started to talk about things like drainage, which is hugely important. For those who remember with the floods, we had those kind of pieces. Uh, and we need to make sure that we have support from community as we do these. Um, all of the experience around a pallet shelter village is they are vastly superior for the residents and for the community that they are in. So very, very good things there, but we still want to build that community. Uh, and Mr. Mayor, that is our rapid update. Yeah, thank you, Max, for the update and the amazing work. Um, you do, thank you, uh, Bill. Also want to recognize Ray Walsh is with us, uh, Director of Parks, like that, that department is all over this stuff and doing amazing work as well. So thank you to you and, and your folks who are doing that. Uh, and, and I don't think 
<clears throat> I don't think people understand how many uh, aspects of our city staff are involved working on this in a, in a really dedicated belief in human rights kind of a way. Um, and I can't say that any more powerfully than when we have people like Carolyn Nichols, the divisional commander, um, and Ian, what's Ian's? Uh, Walsh. Ian Walsh, officer who are dealing with uh, some of the stuff in Dartmouth and, and the officers across the municipality. There's so many people working in this. And uh, we, have the RCMP here today. we also, by the way, have uh, our RCMP here. Jeff uh, is here, Christy, the boss, the grand master. Um, Apparently can't sit in chairs, he has to sit on a bench. Thank you for coming uh, to be part of this as well. I just, my point is there's a lot of people doing a lot of work that kind of goes unseen in this. When you consider where we were a couple of years ago as a city, homelessness wasn't something that we spent a lot of time on because uh, it's not in our area of jurisdiction, but there's a lot of work happening by a lot of people. And I want to thank everybody. Councillor, where am I going? Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the update. I'm thrilled to see so much of this uh, coming together. I had a, a heads up on a little bit of it, and and I'm I'm thrilled that we're we're able to talk about it more fully. Um, I do have a thousand questions, or or, or maybe a dozen, uh, and I'm sure that they I'm sure that you probably know them. Um, maybe just put the motion on the floor to kick us off. I if can you do would, that Council. too. Uh, I move that if, if I speak first, if I pull away Mason, I can speak for five minutes, then put the motion on the floor, then... Everybody has a trick, and you know your share. Okay, uh, I move that Halifax Regional Council endorse the approaches contained in the staff report dated October 17th, 2023. Second by a bunch of people. Go ahead, uh, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with the one that's closest to here, and I'm curious about uh, why Grand Parade and Victoria Park were chosen as locations uh, to turn into designated sites. Um, then jump into the pallet shelter villages. I assume we will take care of maintenance. I assume, uh, sorry, uh, and, and would appreciate confirmation of that. Uh, are they insulated and fire retardant? Are they single occupancy? Uh, one of the things that we have been uh, hearing about a lot of places is uh, single or multi-occupancy. Um, what about pets? What about accessibility? Uh, you've talked about service providers. Are they going to be on site 24-7 um, at the tiny homes location and at anywhere that we have a pallet shelter village? Uh, you mentioned the RVs in Shuby Park. What about sewer? And that is just our visa should be park. What about other vehicles? What about someone living in uh, whatever car they have? Um, that's it as far as questions go. That should keep you busy. All right, Max. Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor, I will take an opportunity, Mr. Mayor, to make a shameless plug for staff. We have staff in almost every department who come forward regularly to volunteer to help yeah. with this and uh, it is not it doesn't matter whether it's legal it's the clerk's office there are staff everywhere in this organization who stand up for this and are willing to help and I, I would not do them a good service to not say that um, so uh, Mr. Mayor through you to the councillor for the questions uh, Grand Parade and uh, Victoria Park the part of the logic is simply to have enough space and in a space where people are comfortable. It's obviously too crowded, but we felt a limited number of people would be sustainable and would allow us to what we've termed to share the park, which we can do both what we want to do and others can do in those spaces. Um, part of the challenge is, is we have so many people that we need to have locations for, but that was the reasoning for that. Okay. Um, in terms of the, your pallet questions, we would certainly do some maintenance. Uh, currently we do something similar with the North Park Shelter, which we opened last year. Um, and in, a, in an agreement, such as we're going to write for these ones, we handle certain repairs, such as a block toilet. But if, for example, they need a major wall redone, we would also handle that, but we bill it back to the province. So, because it is easier for us and uh, 
Some of you are aware of Paul Duke, who works in B the building maintenance system. He has this very well worked out and very smooth. So if a window breaks, we would replace the window. There'd be a question of, of whether the province would or not. Uh, they are insulated according up, up to minus 40, and they are being used in Boston right now. Okay. Successfully. Um, they are single occupancy. We, uh, they do come with a version that is double occupancy, but all of the communities we've talked to have said double occupancy adds a layer of complexity and a series of other problems that we don't necessarily uh, want to invite on ourselves. So we are um, working with Pallet Shelter to, gain, to sort of learn from those experiences. And one of the, the unique things about Pallet Shelter is they will not sell you these. If you do not put them in a location that they believe is best for the people, so in other words, they have to be on transit. They have to be near grocery stores. They have to be, they have a list of things um, that they, they, they must be if you're going to use them. Otherwise, they say you're not our type of an organization we want to partner with. Okay. So they also provide us guides and, and a host of tools that is remarkable. Um, you asked about accessibility. Uh, these units are flat ground, so as long as we make the space to them, they are accessible. Including wide enough? They, uh, yes. Yep. And we, uh, we did bring that up with the province uh, yesterday to talk about tiny homes. If you look back on the presentation, the design of a tiny home doesn't include an accessible bathroom, so we will probably adjust some of them to make that accessibility. You asked about pets. Our goal would be to have some that where pets are allowed. It is one of the biggest challenges uh, for people and it is often some of those folks that uh, ground search and rescue encounters during hurricanes yep. who can't go in because they don't have a place for their pet and so they would be able to bring their pet in. Uh, service providers would be providing uh, services on site. When we talked about the tiny homes project, the initial plan is that there would be somebody there 24-7. Um, there is also an evaluation component that will help inform that. In terms of the RV, uh, the intent of the plan at this point is that we would pump out people's sewer out of their RV toilet. Um, and that is how it would be managed so that it would not be dumped on the ground. There is uh, obviously some risks with people dumping and things like that. So the contractor who would run the site is going to visit the site every week. They're going to have a person who is available one quarter time for that. Okay. We will have compliance visit twice a week and we will have a street navigator visit once a week for humanitarian aid and things like that. And we'll adjust those times as needed. Uh, and your last question was about vehicles and cars. That is something we're still working on. We don't have a, a good answer for that one yet. Okay. Um, obviously something we need to solve as we know we have people who are, are in their vehicles, uh, but I don't have a full answer for you at this time. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. That, that, that's a lot of answers though. That's a lot of answers. Uh, thank you, Councillor Russell. Uh, Councillor uh, Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you very much, Max and Bill. Uh, this is amazing information and it's very timely. I have a couple of questions. Um, what about families? Have we, do we have anything in mind for a bigger tiny home or anything like that for the, like say a four person family? Uh, my other question is, what criteria decides between being housed in a pallet shelter or a tiny home? And would the pallet shelters have access to water? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor. Families, traditionally, we are dealing with in a, in a different way through a diversion program. Uh, the initial pilot of tiny homes does not include a family option, uh, but there certainly are options that are being explored in other parts of North America that have family options like that. Okay. So it's certainly something that's possible. Uh, it's just not in the pilot. Part of the, part of the beauty of the pilot is these can be produced essentially, a cut can be made and they can be pushed very quickly through a production facility. 
but we certainly could look at other options as we go forward in the evaluation okay. um, from there. In terms of criteria, there are a number of criteria. Obviously, the choice of the person being housed uh, would uh, would indicate would would certainly play into that. So would location. So would, for example, if uh, one of them is a dry site, we would want somebody who is committed to their sobriety and, and abstaining from substance abuse. Uh, and probably the wraparound services that would be done at that site would be different than the ones that would be done somewhere else. Um, there would be some, some rules and guidelines that would be in place. So I'm not sure that we, would do f that we would do formal leases for the person, but there would be an agreement you would sign um, that, that this, is, this is what you agree to do. There would be able to you know, do some inspections on that. Uh, we do know at times some people aren't successful based on who's around them. And things. So there would be a whole variety of criteria. Uh, also, quite frankly, um, people will have preferences of their own um, for what they need. So there will be a variety of that. Also, the service providers will set some of those. Uh, for example, there are some service providers who will not be equipped to consider a harm reduction model. Uh, where there are others that are. So there will be some differences there set by them. Again, though, why we feel it is critical that we have, that we bring support to a coordinated approach okay. so that those criteria can be, they can be aligned. You don't go to one village which has a completely set of different rules right. than another and all of those types of things. Uh, we'll ha and we'll have more as we begin to work over the next three months till they're in place as we develop more of those information with the province and the service providers. Okay. And just about the water for the power. Oh, water. Uh, water would be provided in a washroom area, so it would be a separate facility for the village. Whereas in the tiny homes, it would be piped in. They'd be fully plumbed. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, thanks, guys. Um, you know, a couple things that you said that makes me, uh, gives me emotion when you're in your, you know, first of all, you talked about our staff. I mean, you know, as frustrating as it was yesterday going down in the province, and the province has amazing staff too, but for you to tell us almost every business unit in HRM have individuals that want to volunteer, I mean, man, I'm so proud of our staff. That's, that's just phenomenal. And it's, it's that human element, right? It goes right across uh, all the employees in, our, in HRM, fantastic. The other statement that really makes me emotional is when you said, there's gonna, if we don't get a shelter, there's 200 people that will have no place to go, and this winter somebody will die. I mean, how do you not pay attention to that? I mean, that's amazing. I mean, that that potentially could happen. You know, and, you know, and as frustrating as yesterday was with the province, you know, they started to step up, as the mayor said earlier in, our, in the in council meeting about, you know, they're finally getting it. They're, they're coming to the table, which is great, and hopefully they'll continue to come to the table. So just take those couple of points. I do have several questions, and uh, watch my time. And um, you talked about the winter shelter and not having a place, but the province is looking at that. Uh, and I'll just uh, uh, state a couple of uh, questions, and uh, then, then you can take over. Um, what does a winter shelter look like? What does that consist of? Like in the past, you talked about standing up a rec center, and we stood up the gray arena in Dartmouth North early on when the pandemic hit and the homeless uh, 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 started to rise. That's not a shelter. That, I mean, that, you know, that served a purpose in an emergency, but you know, I, you can't imagine that is what we're talking about if we're looking at a rec center. That scenario that we saw in dark, uh, at the Gray Arena, uh, the the Grand Parade. At the, uh, you talked about the numbers allowing that as a designated area. Uh, is there ability to control where the tents go so that we can still have the Remembrance Days and the Christmas celebration at the same time, right? Problem is right now, it's all over the place and maybe that leads to that question, what are we doing about Remembrance Day? Have we, have we progressed? Uh, what's the conversation going about there? Um, I see tents empty out here. So do we have a process when a tent is empty and where they're abandoned uh, that we can remove them? Um, so if they're not there, there's, there's a couple of tents on the side of a hill. I'm going, I, there can't be somebody 
sleeping on the side of the hill like that. I mean, is there any process to deal with that? I learned from you earlier in the week, and I didn't understand this, and maybe others did. When we talk about wraparound services, there's no wraparound services for people living in tents. So even at our designated areas, I didn't realize that. So are there conversations with the province uh, right now about at our designated sites uh, that we have wraparound services? Because they should have wraparound services too, just because the other one has a, a bit of a, a building, that, uh, that doesn't mean they don't deserve wraparound services. If you, so you, you can speak to that. I've got a few more, why don't you answer those questions, I'll come back after that. I, I was feeling the glare of the mayor in my back of my head, so yeah. <laughs> I, I saw the glare, but uh, go ahead. Okay, so what does a winter shelter look like? Um, quite frankly, the, what, what we did in the gray arena is a version of a shelter. It's very, very basic. Um, ideally, what does it look like? It looks like everybody has a bed, some kind of partition that gives you some privacy. If you've seen the uh, the post-COVID or during COVID model of um, Turning Point. They did a very nice job of that. If you've toured North Park Street, yeah, they've yeah. done a very nice job of that. Okay. Um, people have a little, a little place for storage. Um, people don't have to leave during the, d during the middle of the day. They yeah. have their spot, they can stay there. Uh, washrooms, food, uh, the ability to actually prepare some things for yourself. So some shelters food is brought in, but it's also nice to have an area where you can heat your own thing up. You can make a Mr. Noodles if you're hungry. You can get a spot of tea if you want that. Um, and usually in a shelter, if, if we've designed it well, it's got spaces for you to talk to a counselor, to right. a worker who's visiting, right. to a navigator, to a housing support staff person. We have the ability to host um, a mobile medical clinic to check people out and things like that. But so ideally people need some level of privacy, not individual rooms, um, and a bit of storage, uh, and some dignity, and things like that. A bit of a space to call their own. Okay. That's what we would look for. Um, we absolutely can control where tents go, as long as we have space for the people who where they shouldn't be have a place to go to. Right. So we are in the process of designing maps for the designated locations here, pending the council vote. And within a week or so, we will have those ready as an insert to our guide that will show people where they can go. We'll also look at some signage. And uh, we have added a staff person to our compliance team whose primary job it will be will be to go to those sites every day, uh, check on folks, and if somebody has uh, either moved somewhere or set up somewhere they shouldn't, we can begin the process to, to direct them to where they should go. But that is all predicated on the fact that we have a place for the extra person to go. And currently we don't have, we will not have enough in the designated locations to do that for everywhere. What are we doing about Remembrance Day? The hope is that we will have a winter shelter announced and that we can then offer a number of people the opportunity to go there and many of them will. And that will create some additional space as well as some extra designated locations. We're hoping that, that we'll be able to do that. But it is much, much predicated on the winter shelter. You asked about tents that are empty. Um, so there are a couple of things. First, people do sleep in tents on slopes, just so you know. Do they? Really? They do. Uh, secondly, when a tent appears empty, it doesn't necessarily mean it is. There are collapsed tents that are simply in so bad shape, but if you come at three in the morning, somebody's in them. Really? So we do have a process. We, uh, we identify an empty tent, and that can be through uh, an outreach that one of you makes, it can be through a 311 call, it can be through um, law enforcement. We then identify the tent, we send a navigator to confirm it's empty, and if they confirm it's empty, then we go and we clean it up and remove it. Uh, you should be aware that one of the number one ways that people who are anti-homeless try and get rid of them is to report their tent empty. Oh, really? And we, on a, on a weekly basis, have reports of empty tents that when we go, we find the person in it. And okay. it's, quite frankly, it, some of it is just people weren't sure, uh, some of it is deliberate. Wow. And so we have to be very, very careful um, 
about removing a tent, especially if it has people's belongings in it. Um, there are also times when somebody's not there that night. They went out somewhere, they missed the last bus, they show up the next day. So we do have a process okay. to do that and take care of that. Okay. Um, you are correct, the, uh, we provide garbage, some wa delivered water and so on to the encampments, but they do not have wraparound services. We have discussed it with the province. Uh, the largest challenge is labor. Um, and I am concerned that we will not have enough labor to do the pallet shelters, let alone could we do it for designated locations. Wow. Um, and uh, the, the, the sector is stretched really thin um, and so I am concerned about that because if you consider that we might have six to seven pallet shelter villages that would need that level of support, that is a lot of people and I am not sure the sector has them. So that is also part of things that we're talking about is how do we, um, how do we step up uh, training and opportunities for folks. We are also looking um, right now at a rather innovative program to allow some of the encampment residents to perhaps do work in their own encampment and be compensated. So to help manage the garbage, to help manage other things, to help manage empty tents, uh, Great all those kind of things. So we do have a staff team um, that is working on that. Okay. Okay, I'll come thank back. You. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Max and company. Um, so at the at the beginning, uh, I would agree with Councillor Mancini. It's always pretty. Well, I can't remember anyone ever saying it um, so starkly. Um, if X doesn't happen, people will die. So that's where we are. Uh, so in that vein, the province, is it labor why they say they can't do two sh winter shelters? Why they're just looking for one winter shelter location? I believe their service provider can only stand up one. Okay. That's really unfortunate because, I mean, if there's folks in my community who don't want to necessarily have to go over to Halifax and vice versa, and, you know, I'm sure it's the same for folks out in Sackville, too, who've been sheltering there. I mean, we, we, the ideal world, we should have a whole bunch of smaller shelters rather than trying to build these really big ones. Um, they, they can work well. I think of the Christchurch shelter in my district, which I had very, very few real complaints about that had any substance behind them. That small operation, it worked well. Um, that's unfortunate. Uh, Martins Park, um, you know, I, I did have uh, a few questions about that one. Um, where I think I know the answer, which is there's nothing else to choose from in downtown Dartmouth. Um, the question I have on it is like the, we have the, the kids focused touch tank opening there with two of by C. We have the Seymour, the turtle, the horticultural sculpture there. And so both those what I think would fit into our administrative order is, you know, things that we would want to not be next to. And I wonder about the canal because it is a steep drop and my understanding is it wasn't related to this, it was some dispute, but what, I believe someone drowned off Kings Wharf um, uh, previously who, was, who had been sheltering in that area and I'm just wondering if we've taken these facts and the construction because potentially next, potentially this winter, we're potentially tendering for the extension of Dundas Street, um, which means there's potentially a major construction site starting sometime next year, um, immediately adjacent. I'm just wondering if we could, have we taken in these pieces into account in coming to Martins Park? Uh, so you're accurate in the there's not much else to choose from. Uh, Star Park is in that area, but we hesitated on that for reasons of previous history. Uh, we wanted to stay away from Sullivan's Pond. We wanted to stay away from Ferry Terminal Park. And so that, the Martins Park, while it does have the touch tank, at least certainly over the winter, um, is not next to, not directly next to housing. So yeah. that was the thought. Uh, we did think about the construction and realized that that might force us 
to reconsider that spot. We do hope by then, though, that we'd have pallet shelters okay. and some other options available to help us reconsider. But being quite frank, um, we don't have enough space uh, to house people, and we are at this time next year going to be having very similar conversations to this in the spring with people in places that we don't want them to be because the, sim the, the load is simply going to be so high. Well, there are other options. Uh, between the devil and the, and the sea, as they say, because uh, Gary Street is way over capacity and there's problems there. So, um, you know, I think, do I think Martins Park is, is a great choice? No. <laughs> but leaving the status quo as it is is also, I don't think, going to work. So I think I can, I can go along with this, but I, you know, I think this is, it's, it's going to be somewhat time dependent such as we can we can kind of work with that, um, which we might not be able to. I mean, we say four tents, there could be a dozen there. And if there's nowhere to move people, we're right back to all that conundrum, you know, even if there is a 15, $20 million water project that's supposed to start next door. Uh, have we talked to the province? Because the, the part, yeah, <laughs> I know. Um, the part that is kind of really about Martins is immediately adjacent to it. Um, is Dartmouth Cove property that Build Nova Scotia own, that's, uh, owns and that developed Nova Scotia owned before them and has been provincially owned do absolutely nothing happening with for basically 30, 40 years. Have we talked to the province? Because uh, in terms, there's no immediate residence to that. There's nothing going on on it. Um, the surface is terrible. Like in terms of a location for um, some sort of sh more structured shelter, have we been engaging with the province on that one? Because in, in downtown Dartmouth, it feels like it feels like a good spot. Uh, we would agree it's a good spot. The problem is the land is toxic for human habitation. So okay. we have talked to the province. They've provided us some options to look at. That was one of them we looked at, and then they came back with a toxicology report that says it's not at this point. We'd have to, the land would have to be remediated to make it suitable. It was the location of the dry cleaner accident, if you remember, years ago. Well, maybe we'll follow up offline because there was a big dig cleanup in that area, but I guess maybe not all the site. Anyway, uh, that's interesting for a whole bunch of other different reasons. Um, <laughs> did we have Counsel we talked? Councillor, I'm going to have to get you to come back. Uh, okay. Your time expired sometime in the recent past. Thank you. Uh, I would ask you to come to the chair just for a sec if you could. Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Max. <laughs> you make me miss my old life. I, I think what you get to do is pretty amazing, and the people that you do it for are so appreciative of it. <clears throat> but and and working as a um, having been a service provider uh, and a great one, I must say, I'm sure that I was. Um, but their work. Service providers are work, and when I think about the coordinator position that you're looking at, and when I look at the budget, my biggest concern is fabulous to have volunteers within business units, um, but we don't want to lose you or the staff that are there now either. Is that enough? It's not, I, I don't think it's enough. Um, it's not a job that's Monday to Friday, eight to four. It is 24 seven. It is one o'clock in the morning. It's two o'clock in the morning, right? There, there is. It's holidays. It's, it's full on 365 days a year, and so one coordinator working to try to make this happen. Um, I think you're being generous so that it gets by, but I am really worried that when we look at the budget for community safety, that it needs to be more than one coordinator. Pardon? Absolutely, we do. Um, so I, I'm worried about that. So that's one thing. Um, I guess the other thing, too, is even considering that when we talk about a coordinator, um, common terms of reference around tents, pallets, tiny homes, about how we how do we going to approach that? Different service providers have different ways of looking. But there is a theme about what do you do when there are moments of vulnerability, even for the persons that are in those experiences, their neighbors, how we approach that, how 
is there going to be some kind of an agreement between HRP and RCMP and service providers? Who comes in when? All of those kinds of things to make sure that everybody's protected. And even to look at that, I see that's almost a full-time job, right? And, and looking at that. And then the other uh, third piece would be absolutely I am a champion of the lived experience. And I wonder with this group that you looked at around lived experience experiences, where is the group within United Way, that group that was set up to talk about lived experience uh, and recommendations? I'm just wondering whether United Way is involved in that too. So again, thank you very much. Um, maybe I'll tackle a couple of those and then Bill can talk about that. Um, is it enough? The answer is no. Uh, but this evolves very quickly. Mm -hmm. So our intent is to come through the budget process with a fairly comprehensive budget that will give us some flexibility Great. to do that. Um, now that we know that pallets are coming, tiny homes are coming, uh, and we'll, hopefully we'll have a winter shelter plus pieces after that, um, that we'll, be, we'll come back with that budget piece that will address that. Um, so that's sort of number one for that. Uh, we have agreed with the province to do an MOU. Okay. Um, one of the other things is the National Alliance to End Homelessness, which is the US equivalent of Canadian Alliance, does actually have a shared glossary that they right. use for all communication. Yeah. So we are hoping to come out of the conference with some agreement around that. Excellent. So that we all, when we all say pallet shelter, we all know what we mean. Um, if we all say tiny home, single o occupancy and so on, we'll do that. And uh, I'll invite Bill to perhaps talk a little and bit about And just the, the lived experience. Oh, the lived experience. Um, that was not a standing group at United Way. Oh. It was a group that we gathered to do that consultation. So we will gather another group, possibly some of the same people. Okay. Um, possibly others. Uh, and again, we'll follow the same principles. We will compensate people for their time and all of those things. And we will get somebody to do it who's not us so that it's independent and we awesome. get some feedback from them. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, th your worship, uh, Deputy Mayor, through the Councillor. Um, Max touched on it. We'll, uh, today's is really an update in the immediacy of getting somebody online to look at the coordination aspect. But as you can see from the presentation Max presided, there's a lot, a lot of moving parts happening in a very short time. So we'll be looking at coming back as part of the budgetary process to see what that looks like. I can tell you I've already had conversations about having someone else that can, that can support Max in his strategic work, because right now, I mean, he's, he's, he's amazing. But I am can <laughs> love him to death. But he's strategic and operational and everything's in between. And I realize that I want to make sure that he's well supported. Um, in the conversation around coordination, um, we internally in HRM, we have actually now have representatives from every business unit to come together as a homeless tax task force to look at how all those pieces come together to support the project, especially in light of us for all intents and purposes with the tiny home, we're basically looking at building a subdivision. Um, and, yes. and with that, where we've not done this in this type of uh, time frame or in this aspect for, we want to make sure that we're not making decisions on behalf of other business units uh, that may have negative consequences or having them bring actually forward, have you thought about this, have you thought about that? Because in each of the aspects with the province and the MOU, there's an option to do a whole different array. Like it can be they do that, we do it, or anywhere is in between. So just making sure that we have a very, as to best as we can, a team approach to, to looking at how this is starting to get put together. And in relation to um, the supports and the, the responses, as Matt, uh, or sorry, as Max mentioned, we have staffed up the two positions um, in bylaw. Um, one of the reasons Superintendent Christie and Mr. Harvey are here is, is in support of that. And we're actually looking at HRM staff at looking at other jurisdictions now on how we collectively look at response, common responses. Um, for instance, uh, Jeff and I have talked about it very quickly in relation to the use of restorative justice. So we know that there, there may be interactions. Well, rather than using the full criminal justice system as an opportunity to use restorative justice practices to, to assist in right. those people that are living there. So those pieces are, are coming together. I'd like to say they're, they're, they're on the good, good path and people are, seem to be very willing to move those forward. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, Ms. Seale? 
If I could add to uh, Executive Director Moore's uh, answer, I just wanted to note that our internal working group, the Homelessness Task Force, is relatively new. I believe there's been one meeting. First meeting will be on the 26th, 25th. There there's, been some, there's been some one-on-ones, but the first collective group meeting. Yeah, and this is something that has arisen from working with the executive leadership team on how we can try to advance some of these strategic issues for the municipality. And one of the things that is also part of the vision is, you know, we start with the internal business units, but I'm also seeing an opportunity for us to add the RCMP as our external service provider. Halifax Regional Library, who are very interactive with the homeless community and providing a number of supports to the homeless community, as well as potentially Halifax Water, because we'll certainly need their expertise when it comes to figuring out how to service the uh, pallet, shelter, and tiny home communities. So we will be expanding our internal working group to include the entire HRM service delivery family. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just just last night, I, I was at a round table discussion in Muscadabra Harbor with the, with the various community service groups there trying to address the homelessness and housing situation we're having on the Eastern Shore. So it's not just an urban uh, issue, it's also a rural issue. But I'm also concerned about the designation of some of the parks we have, especially Victoria Park and especially Grand Parade. We have Remembrance Day coming up. We have the Christmas, Christmas tree lighting, the lighting of the menorah uh, candles and New Year's Eve functions, just to name a few of the big community functions we normally have in downtown Halifax. And have those displaced, I, I think it would be a shame for our total citizenry. I know we have some vulnerable citizens out there, and I think we need to find accommodation somewhere, somehow, but more quickly. I'm kind of curious what capacity uh, is the Dartmouth Doubletree uh, uh, Hilton at? You know, the, the, the province rented that building. Where is the capacity of that? What about our other shelter or service providers, the Salvation Army, the YMCA, YWCA, the John Howard, the Elizabeth Fry Society, the Brunswick Street Church or Turning Point? What's their capacity? What, what are they, what kind of clientele are they currently serving and do they have any additional capacity or not? And, and if it comes to property, we have a large open block just down here, the old former federal Ralston building, the Canada, Bank of Canada building, one huge city block sitting empty, fenced in and everything else. It could be easily, uh, it's already been graded, it's been graveled and everything else. And right beside it we have the Department of Transportation parking lot. You know, there's property in downtown Halifax that we could modify to utilize. You know, it may not be our property, but we need to look, we need to find partners out there. If the province want to get rid of a paid parking lot site for for a shelter village, so be it. I think if um, if uh, Hollis Investments, uh, who owned that big city block where the former Ralston building was, it'd be a godsend if we had some collaboration, cooperation, even for the short term, because they're not going to be pouring any concrete there anytime soon. But in the meantime, we can probably put a, a few, a small shelter village there in the meantime. So I think we need to reach beyond our municipal properties and go for some private property owners that have some vacant properties. We're talking recently about maybe having a vacant lot tax. Well, perhaps a vacant lot service would be better. Thank you. Thank you, no comments on that. Um, Uh, Max? Uh, the majority of service providers are, are quite full. I don't have uh, updates in the past two weeks on the Doubletree, but I know two weeks ago the medical floor was over half empty, which is because of a st staffing issues. And so they do have rooms there, but they're allocated for their health program. Thank you. Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Max and Bill and your team and all of staff. I, I think we have the best municipal staff ever. Um, just so thank you uh, for what everyone's doing behind the scenes that we don't even know. Um, uh, thanks for this report. This is 
so sad um, and so um, it's just sad. It feels like um, it's the, the, the pit that just doesn't have a, a bottom to it. Um, very good to see that there are some r solutions, uh, pilot solutions, I guess, see how, see how it goes. But at, I mean, it looks hopeful, I guess. Um, I'm still not in favor at all of, of using municipal parkland for encampment sites. Um, the voice of the voices of nearby residents and, and businesses are are really important in this conversation, and we're not really hearing from them or about them very much at all. And um, they're important stakeholders in this as well. And um, I'm I'm wondering what's come of any talks like of, of federal lands, of parking lots, empty lots, kind of, uh, Councillor Hensby was mentioning some, some potential lots there. For example, Shannon Park lands, like where are we at that? That's a great location that could potentially be used. Um, and wondering too, just practically, I, I am in support of, of this uh, re update strategy. We have to vote on this, but I am not, in in favor of municipal parkland use. I, I think it is very damaging to a community uh, and it's, it's, it's not dignifying. I mean, it's just not. So how do you, do, can you pull that? Can I pull that out or will I have to vote no to the whole thing because of one small portion? You would have to vote no, but there's a larger issue here in that use of municipal parkland has already been enabled by council in a June 2022 Yep. decision on a homelessness uh, framework. So um, we would have to have two thirds to have a vote of rescission on that. Okay, um, so I guess just uh, where are we at with Shannon Park and um, like park uh, other lots and empty lots? Um, are those even being pursued for possible alternative sites so we are having conversations with Canada land and Shannon Park uh, very very positive conversations um, I believe they want to help awesome. uh, so we are working through those those details of how that would work what are they comfortable with on their lands what kind of support do they need uh, I'm touring a section on Friday awesome. with staff from them so they're being very supportive but we need to work through a, a host of issues because we also want to be careful that we're integrated with their plan for the site and things like that. So, so just on that, I, I still have a little bit of time. If, if that goes through, I mean, that's a big parcel of land. There could be like multiple encampment sites on there potentially. Is that true? Not true? Uh, like, could... In theory, yes, but they do have extensive work they're going to do, including significant roadway work, so not all of them would be accessible. Um, so it would be, there would, there would certainly be some, uh, and we're talking to them about tents and pallets, shelters. Yeah. Um, so we're working on both of those and, and, and have had very good conversations. They're very keen to help. And, Awesome. want to do that okay. your other question was about parking lots we certainly are talking to folks um, there is not a lot of appetite to have a homeless encampment on a private piece of property right. so we continue to work on that it's also a bit of a capacity issue okay. um, we've prioritized right now the uh, the pallet shelters and tiny homes projects we've prioritized the RV work uh, but we do still continue to talk to folks about it. Um, but again, as we, as we outlined in that report, it, it's a hard sell for some private landowners without some additional incentive mm -hmm. that, uh, that would excite them. Yeah, for sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'll just take a moment here then um, before we go back for a second, uh, <clears throat> a second round. Um, I'm not in favor of people sleeping in parks either but there's no choice. They're doing it now. And from a human rights point of view, you have to help people. From a Charter of Rights and Freedoms legal point of view, we can't move them unless there's a better place to, to, to house them. So, <clears throat> you know, I hear sometimes from folks, um, 
Well, I'd like to help, but I just don't think people should be living in tents. They're living in tents now. If we can improve their lot while we get them into a better situation, that's what we need to try to do. Um, Councillor Mancini can speak to the to the Shannon piece. He's put a lot into that as well as Max and and um, and others. I'm very hopeful that that there's a solution there for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we come a long way in the last couple of years in terms of the resource we're putting into this, but it's not getting better anytime soon. So what the province did last week was helpful. Um, you know, uh, 100 pallet shelters is 100 pallet shelters. Uh, you know, um, the mini homes will help. Um, uh, but I, I sometimes think what, what misses is the situation right now um, as we, and this is an all year problem, it's not just a winter problem. It's no fun sleeping outside. People aren't camping when they're in tents in the summer. They're because they haven't got a place to live. But as we're staring into November, you know, we've got to provide the support to people in the best possible way we can. In some cases, that's going to be um, giving them a more secure and um, uh, serviced type of uh, uh, site for an encampment, as much as none of us really see that as any kind of a solution for a human being. Uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much for this presentation, uh, for the update. Um, it's important, I think, for uh, not only for council, but for the public to understand um, the situation that we have in our municipality. Um, you know, as Councillor Hensby has alluded to, this is not an urban issue, um, as we've discussed, right? We know that it's throughout the entire municipality. What we also know is that homelessness is increasing across the entire province. And as such, uh, more and more people are coming from outside of HRM into HRM to access the services that are available here, but not available at their home municipality. And so my, my question is, how do we recti re reconcile with the fact that we've, we have an increasing population in our municipality that comes from elsewhere? Uh, because of the lack of services from the provincial government provided to those smaller municipalities. And of course, the other issue, which isn't touched on in this report, is the increasing insecurity and vulnerability of youth. Uh, we are, well, we know that Phoenix youth uh, is drowning and struggling with being able to provide services to young people who are living on our streets and in tents. Uh, we just heard uh, over the summer at the Women's Advisory uh, Committee um, for HRM about uh, the state of human trafficking in this municipality and in this province. Uh, we know that uh, the most vulnerable are not getting the resources that they need, and yet they are the ones uh, <laughs> that, that we know need the most support. There's no doubt about it. So. Uh, I would like to know where are we with supporting Phoenix? Where is community services uh, in, in recognizing this humanitarian crisis with young people between the ages of 12 and 19? Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor, um, you're absolutely correct that people come here because there's better services. Uh, and quite frankly, the announcement of pallet shelters in a, in a tiny homes community is going to exacerbate that. Exactly. Um, Councillor Russell and I have talked about the fact that we expect that there will be people who will move to the ball field, hoping that that will guarantee them a tiny home. Exactly. Um, however, as we've said, there's already more people there than there will be tiny homes. Um, but that doesn't stop people from coming because they are desperate and looking for support. Right. Uh, one of the ways we mitigate that is the province putting pallet shelters and supports in other communities. And so for example, there are of that hundred that are going into the, into the rest of the province, that will hopefully mean somebody, for example, in a community in the valley goes, wow, I can get it right there. And we'll hopefully do that. But I fully expect the problem will be exacerbated coming into spring and summer. Yeah. with more people coming. Now there's also good news, New Brunswick, there are places in New Brunswick putting pallet shelters in as well. Um, but yes, we will still see some more people. Uh, yes, you're quite correct. Um, the last time I talked to Phoenix, which was a little while ago, they were turning at times 22 youth away a night who need help. Uh, so 
Uh, I'm, I know community services is aware of it. Uh, I, I can't really speak to um, what their plans are around it, uh, but I certainly can tell you that the problem is growing faster than we're applying resources to it. So some noise needs to be made, Max, because these young people are extremely vulnerable. And, um, you know, I, I, I just feel like it, there, there has to be more of an effort. I was disappointed to see that it wasn't even mentioned in the report, considering the stark reality of the percentage of homeless people are young people. And they're not getting the supports that they need. So. I'll leave it at that, but I would like to see in, in some kind of recommendation of how we can move this issue forward for the youth in HRM. Thank you. See you on that. Uh, through Mr. Mayor to the councillor and to staff, <laughs> I do want to express a little bit of caution that we are creeping into new program areas and doing things we've never done before. That's why we're coming to council so frequently to talk to you about homelessness as we try to set up these new programs. And right now, we're struggling just to deal with the basic necessities of emergency shelter. And we're approaching it from the perspective of dealing with the homeless community as one population. We're relying upon community services to a large extent to bring those different lenses. And I'm sure as we work through that MOU report we have to bring back yes. to Council on roles and responsibilities, we'll be able to flesh some of that out. But right now, to the extent possible, we're trying to keep our involvement focused to the aspects that align most closely with our municipal service delivery capabilities. So whether it's, you know, the operational servicing, the matters that go with land, the solid waste maintenance, you know. But there's we... policing too. Oh yes, and, and the policing, policing aspects, and human fire protection, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, there are some other pieces though that will come through the work on organizing the wraparound services. Yes. And w as we flesh out those roles and responsibilities, I think that we'll get to a place where um, we have a much more refined approach. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. This has been fantastic. Uh, hearing about uh, so much work that has been done, hearing about uh, the staff that has been uh, supporting it, and uh, amazing. Um, I do have one more question, and then I'm going to make a, and then I'm going to move an amendment to uh, to the report, and it'll be unrelated. Uh, the question is the pallet shelters. One of the challenges that we have with the tents uh, is, is um, in, in Lower Sackville, we have them in a ball field, so we have, coincidentally, electricity. And uh, they are talking about um, uh, heat and uh, some way to keep food cold and some way to cook it. Last year, uh, they had space heaters inside the tents, which was innovative and blew uh, the power out repeatedly. And for the pallet shelters, all, although we talked about uh, insulation and, and, and stuff, will they have heat built into the pallet shelters and will they have the ability to have something of a fridge and something either a hot plate or a stove and will that be regulated? So yes, they come with a built-in heater. and and and. Fridge and stove? No, they come with a built-in heater. Okay. We can add air conditioning to that at a later point if that's something we, we need to look at down the road. Uh, the, they don't come, they come with power and outlets. Okay. So one of the things that we've talked about is um, United Way being, they are interested in a role. Uh, there's a big community volunteer group that's interested in a role. Yep. And so, some of those, there are corporations that want to help. So through those, we would, um, we would hope to be able to sort of add to those features like that. Uh, in terms of rules, we would have some rules of what you can and can't have uh, based on safety and things like that. Sure. And there'd be stuff in a common, the, the tiny homes pilot also includes a, a, a collective service center, which could have some of those other things as well. 
Okay, the, the tiny home's floor layout that I saw looked like it had a kitchen. It does have a space, it's got a kitchen sink and some plugs so they can put Council, if you're going to put them in an amendment, you've got a very short time to do it. I just want to give you that opportunity. We have had challenges with the parks. Uh, we have a number of people sleeping in parks, including Grand Parade and Victoria Park. Um, we don't need them to be a designated site. If we have them as, as a designated site, then we also are supplying porta potty and water, which I don't have a problem with. I just don't want to include them as a designated site. So I move uh, as soon as I can find the motion uh, that the motion be amended to remove Grand Parade and Victoria Park from the inventory of outdoor sites available for, out, uh, for outdoor sheltering. Thank you. Um, this has been a discussion that I have had with the community, uh, with some members of the community for quite some time. Um, again, we already have people who are at Victoria Park and at Grand Parade. Uh, I don't think we need to elevate this to, uh, uh, to the next level. Um, we will have other locations for them. We, do, we will have other facilities for them, so we are able to retain the use of Grand Parade and Victoria Park. One of the interesting things that happened this summer that we heard about is an individual came along and he, he was a tourist and he could have gone to a hotel um, and paid $230 a night or whatever it was, saw the people were in Grand Parade, picked up a tent and pitched his tent in Grand Parade and stayed there for the week. We do have a rule against uh, camping in parks. In this case, it, it was camping. He wasn't homeless. Um, he didn't fit any of the criteria of that. He was just camping. And I, I think we have to be very, very careful if we're going to take Grand Parade and Victoria Park and turn them into a designated tenting location. So I'd appreciate uh, hearing of everybody's opinion on that. Thank you. We'll start with the CAO. Thank you through uh, the mayor to the councillor. If we do remove those two locations, we will add to need, add some other locations to accommodate the people who are currently at those locations because we do not have enough space with the currently designated locations. The second piece, well, two other pieces. One is that um, we are somewhat concerned with wanting to do this in a way that doesn't wind up with another, you know, August 18th, 2021 um, type experience. And we recognize that um, although we will be moving people, not evicting people, there will be some people who may refuse to move. Um, the advantage of leaving those two sites or making those two sites designated is if we can get it down to a, a manageable number from a health and safety and public safety you know, perspective, then um, it may be manageable and to entice other people to move from that site to a different location. The third point I wanted to make is we do have plans with the additional designated locations we're identifying. We recognize that we're gonna be posting signage in all of our designated locations. We will have limits on numbers and we will be using a variety of uh, staff and different enforcement tools to monitor and we will be proactively trying to identify the campers versus the homeless um, and encouraging people who are camping to go to a campsite. Max may wish to add. I, I think uh, we just need to recognize that by not designating them, the people are still there. And they're not designating, there's nothing to move people out is just, and that's fine, I, I don't have an issue with that. But especially for people who are watching, we want to make sure that we understand that by not designating doesn't change that. Um, and it further restricts the options that we have for people to try and move a little bit, uh, especially further down the road. That said, if we're overcrowded, they'll be there anyway, so. Yeah. Okay, uh, colleagues, we're gonna give us a few more minutes to see if we can finish this item before we take our break. If not, if people feel stifled, then we'll take the uh, supper break. Uh, on this, Councillor Outhit. 
Thank you, Amen. I just want to continue on the CAO for a moment. I mean, it makes sense. I think we all understand that we would not, if this motion were to pass, this amendment were to pass, that we would not take any action until a, a suitable alternate location was available. And I think we all agree on that. But where this breaks down when the public calls us and says, I think most people understand that we're not going to move somebody till there's a place, hopefully a better place, if you will, better. But if they still refuse to go, we're not going to move them, is what I'm hearing. And I think the public has a hard time understanding that to some extent. And, and, and no, we don't want another August 18th, but the biggest problem with August 18th was that there wasn't another place to go, and we were misled by whoever, whenever. So I'm just, I, we're just sort of sending messages. It's not, if, if there's another place for us to go, you can go here, but if you don't go, that's okay, we'll just ignore it. So for clarity, my understanding is if we give a individual an option or options of right. you can go here or you can go there, right. but you can't remain in this spot. Right. Um, if they're given other options, but they choose to reject those options, then we do have the ability to right. remove them. Now, and I hope it will come to that. I hope that we'll do such a good job of designing better encampments, and, and more importantly, as everybody around this table, I think, believes, better, something better than the, the tents, as the mayor said, I hope that they will move. But my worry is that there may be a few who just don't want to move for mental health reasons or not wanting to play by the rules for addiction issues or whatever. So this is, this is not going to be tough. But I think that's important because there are people who really just don't understand. They understand that they have to have somewhere to go. They don't understand when we say, well, but we're not going to force them to go. There's no question about that. <clears throat> I mean, what I don't want to do is get into a situation where somebody will say that HRM is saying they're going to move people if they don't move today. Um, yeah, I agree. We, we're going to try to give people better options that better suit their needs. Yep. That's our goal. I agree. And that's yep. what we're, so I, but I understand the concern that you mm -hmm. raise. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Deputy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I'm going to just start this because uh, you've said this several times yourself. We all agree we don't want people living in parks, and so what we disagree is what we should do with the horrible reality that we are in right now where uh, no one living in parks is not an option that's available to us. Um, you know, that Herald story that you referenced, uh, Councillor Russell, um, I cringed when I read it because I knew as soon as I read that, that it would become a touch point for reference from then on about, well, we don't really need to do anything because you know some of these homeless people are just choosing to be homeless. They're on, on some kind of summer vacation. Um, you know, I think this is one of these things, it, it, it's right along with, well, they're not really from here. They're like, you know, we're attracting people in. These are things we, we tell ourselves as to, whether knowingly or subconsciously, as an excuse to then not do anything. Because it's like, well, I don't really need to help these people because they're tourists. I don't really need to do help these people because they're not from here. And, you know, that's really not where we need to be. Like, out of a list of what, we're over 200 people living outside. Um, out of a list of 200, we have one story about some tourist, I think he was from Chile, that was, that was here visiting. That's not the reality of folks out there at all. And so I think, like, uh, I don't know if that was your intent, uh, Councillor Russell, I don't think it was, but I think, you know, we have to be very clear about that. These are the one-offs. These are not the realities. So, you know, and we can close parks. We did it with Mar Park. There was no August 18th at Mar Park. Um, there was a lot of work by our staff um, and, you know, including our directors <laughs> at times going well above the call of duty to close that down with no violence, with no problems, because we were giving people better options. Um, there's not a lot of other choices out there. We, as council, we looked at when we were thinking about the common. We said, well, no, we can't do the common. And we were warned at that time, well, if you're not going to do the common, you might not like the other choices that you have to <laughs> come with. And so if today we're saying, oh, no, we can't do Grand Parade, we can't do Victoria Park, okay, well, <laughs> What's the one after that, right? Like, none of these choices are good choices. None of them. I just talked about Martins Park, which I don't like in my own district as being a place, but I recognize that in the sea of totally awful choices, you gotta choose something. 
we have to make some choice. Um, it's certainty, like designating a site brings certainty for the people who are living there in survival mode. It says to them that yes, you can stay here and you're not gonna be hassled and told to leave and be harassed. Uh, I would ask staff, from a service perspective, when we designate a site, we start providing more services there, do we not? So, it's not just uh, if we don't designate these locations, um, well, we don't have to designate these locations because you know people will still be there anyway, no harm, no foul. If we don't designate these locations, we will be not providing the services that a designated encampment would get, and these people who are out there trying to survive are left with worse options. Just because we say, well, no, we can't do that. If not that, what? So I would very much urge council to vote this down because I, I, I don't like it either, but I'd rather do better by, for some of these folks who are struggling on the margins by designate, giving them the certainty of, yes, you can stay here and that the municipality will provide you with some more, with a higher level of service than you're getting now. Thank you. Okay, we got a few people on this amendment. It's uh, coming up on quarter past. Do folks want to take a break now and come back to this after the public hearing? Or do you? Okay, I'm hearing that we probably should uh, take a break, come back at six o'clock, public hearing. I will not be here. Councillor Lovelace will be in the chair. Um, I just want to do a check. Is everybody else good for tonight for the public hearing and the meeting beyond that? Is there anybody that's not? Okay, colleagues, we'll take a break and uh, resume. Max, Bill, Ray, Chief Superintendent. And I just want to mention, uh, Graham Hicks, uh, folks, uh, mentioned to me that not only does he come and sit through council every week, he watched all of law amendments yesterday uh, as well. So thank you for your dedication. Maybe someday you'll have a chair with your name on it over there too. Thank you very much. We'll take a break.
Thank you, Boyd. Uh, we'll, we'll call things back to order. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, the mayor is off at uh, an event this evening, welcoming, welcoming our visiting uh, Republic of Korean ship in port today. So uh, I'm your MC for the evening, although I'm going to yield it over to Councillor Lovelace uh, immediately here for our public hearing. So thank you, Deputy. Uh, good job. Um, so thank you for joining us today for a public hearing. The process will be that we start with a staff presentation, questions uh, of clarification from staff, and then give the applicant an opportunity to present. After that, we'll go straight to the public hearing. Uh, speakers can participate for a maximum of five minutes. Please keep your comments respectful on topic and direct to the chair. The clerk will announce when you have 30 seconds left and when your time is complete uh, for the speaker, the clerk will also let you know your time is up. After everyone on this very long list has, given an opportunity, has been given an opportunity to speak, I'll call three times to see if there are any additional speakers. So clerk, can you please confirm if there are any additional correspondence that's been received for this public hearing since the beginning of the meeting today? There has not. Well, thank you, Madam Clerk. I will then ask John Dalton. Hello, John, how you doing? I understand you have a presentation for us. Yes, thank you, Count thank you uh, Chair Lovelace and Councillors. So I have a brief presentation, fairly standard, on street closure for Windmill Road, a portion of Windmill Road, PID 4038313, and it's known as parcel B2B. So I'm going to cycle through that for your information. Legislative authority for this particular street closure, section 325 of the Halifax Regional Municipal Charter. The council may by policy permanently close any street or part of a street, and the council shall hold a public hearing before passing the policy. The subject parcel, as I mentioned a bit earlier, is identified as 4038031. Highlighted in red, this is a very small parcel, just around about 2,800 square feet. The specific location along Windmill is at the intersection with Trinity and Spring Hill. And this parcel was a declared surplus quite some time ago by Regional Council as part of our Administrative Order 50 back in August 2013. So this has been a remnant surplus piece of property for quite some time for this palette. The reason for the closure, the existing Windmill Road right-of-way corridor alignment is the result of infrastructure upgrades conducted during the 1970s. The proposed right-of-way boundary was established to ensure municipal assets remain within the public right-of-way. And if the street closure is approved, there's an applicant that intends to consolidate parcel B2B with their abutting property. So speaking of which, again, the, the red portion is the, uh, the subject property that we wish to declare uh, closed as a public street. The light blue is an abutting property owner, Cedar Mount Developments. They own uh, a number of adjacent properties, and the goal is to consolidate this property with their existing land holdings. And for some specifics, this is the, the survey plan with the details on the length, the width, the area, again in red. And just an enhancement parcel B2B. A recommendation from staff, it is recommended that Halifax Regional Council adopt Administrative Order SC-102, respecting closure of a portion of Windmill Road, Dartmouth, as set out in Attachment B of the staff report, dated July 24, 2023, to close that portion of the Windmill Road right-of-way, Dartmouth, shown as parcel B2B in Attachment A of the staff report, dated July 24, 2023. So that concludes our staff presentation. Thank you, Mr. Dalton. Uh, I now ask if there are any questions from council, and I do not see anyone on the board, so thank you. Uh, I will now open the public hearing. 
uh, and invite the applicant, Isaac and Pierre Karam of Cedar Mount Developments, if you wish to speak. The, uh, the applicant had indicated to me they wish to respond to any questions, but they, in fact, do not have a presentation. I, I did present that message on, but um, just for your information. Sure. Okay, well, thank you for that. Then I suspect, based on that response, that there are no questions for clarification. So we'll move on then to the speaker's list. Members of the public will be given five minutes to address the topic. When I call your name, you can come up to the microphone. Madam Clerk, do we have a list of speakers? There are no registered speakers. Thank you. There are no registered speakers. So I'll now ask if there's anyone else in the gallery who would like to speak today. Is there anyone? who would like to speak at this public hearing? For a third time, is there anyone who wishes to speak? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, since there have been no comments from the public and uh, the applicant has not presented, uh, we will move forward uh, to ask for a motion to close the public hearing, please. Thank you, Councillor Austin, seconded by Councillor Stoddart. And uh, staff, any other comments, Mr. Dalton? Uh, no, other than staff does look forward to concluding this transaction with the applicant and this meets all of our municipal requirements. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. What a contentious event. Councillor Mancini, you have the floor. Well, you know, we get along so well in direct, but uh, Councillor Austin really wanted to put it on the floor. We went back and forth. You put it on the floor. Now you put it on the floor. I'm happy to put it on the floor, uh, Madam Chair. I put the... <laughs> I put the following motion on the floor uh, that the Halifax Regional Council approve Administrative Order SC-102 as set out attachment B of uh, the staff report dated July 24, 2023 to officially close a portion of the surplus windmill road street right away as shown in parcel B to be so moved. Second. Well, thank, thank you. That has been seconded by Deputy Mayor Austin. Go ahead, Councillor uh, Mancini. Deputy Mayor Austin, thank you for your support as always. I, I appreciate it. You know, colleagues, not too much. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, so I have nothing to add. I just suggest we just uh, approve this and move on. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now call for the question. Question's question. been called. Um, Madam Clerk, over to you. <laughs> Turn off my mic, please. <laughs> And that motion passes. Thank you, colleagues. We're going to move back to 1515 and put the deputy mayor in the chair. Thank you. <laughs> what was that? Uh, the question of what was. Uh, the question of what was that is when you discovered down on the floor that it's actually on the District 6 side of the line rather than the District 5. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Much appreciated for both of us in Dartmouth. <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll pick up where we left off. If we can get the list back up, I think, I think it was Councillor Mancini. I know, Ms. Clerk, we're trying to ask you to be in everywhere at once. Okay, we'll go to Councillor Mancini. All right, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor, and uh, the amendment we're talking about. Yes, yeah, we're talking about the amendment. So, so my cons my concern is not designating Victoria Park and the Parade Square is, first of all. We don't have 100% control of any of these sites, but we, by not designated, we have less control. Uh, you know, my interpretation is if we don't uh, designate the sites, then we have a harder time controlling the numbers. So if we just clarify if that's accurate or not. Um, and to move people, obviously when we go to move someone that's living rough, we always have to have a, an option for them. But by having a designated site gives us a better strategy to be able to move people if we have a proper spot. spot. The conversation we had earlier in the main motion was around lack of wraparound services, and I know that staff are having conversations with the province about how do we have wraparound services. I would interpret that if a site is not designated, 
there's a fat chance of them going near that site with any wraparound services, but if it's a designated site that we have controls and supports in place, if we're able to get there, at least there's a chance, I believe in my interpretation, that they might consider that if we're able to get them there, if we're organizing it. And with, I think mentioned by the CAO, if it's a designated site, we're gonna provide more HRM services. So just, could you just clarify, I'm, I'm correct in all of that, Max, if you don't mind? Uh, Deputy Mayor, through you to the Councillor. Uh, certainly, we provide more support at a designated location. If there were wraparound services, we would prioritize those for designated locations over non-designated. Uh, in terms of being able to more control to move people, the challenge is right now we we don't really have anywhere to move anybody right. to exactly. because of volume of, of, of numbers. Yeah. Uh, though ultimately the designated location provides more comfort in some ways to the resident there because they know that they are allowed to be there and aren't going to be harassed and so on. Uh, ultimately, we need indoor housing options for no people question. to be able to move them and uh, we'll always have designated locations because there will always be some who yep. show up and so on. Uh, so certainly, yes, I think that if, if we had sufficient indoor housing options, sufficient sheltering, then yes, the designated location gives us some more options. Yeah. So thank you, Max. Stating that, uh, Deputy Mayor, I, you know, uh, uh, Councilor Russell, I, I can't support the, the, uh, the, your, your motion because of those reasons, so uh, I'll be voting against it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Cleary. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, not surprisingly, I won't be dissimilar from other people that have spoken already. Um, when we think about the uh, the demand, <clears throat> obviously we need more spaces, not fewer spaces, because there's just the volume of people out there need to be accommodated. Um, in terms of Grand Parade and Victoria Park, <laughs> when, we, when we talk about the criteria that we mentioned earlier, when we first designated some sites, you know, we, we don't want them to be uh, very close to homes, we don't want them to be close to schools, we don't want them to be close to daycares. We don't, so you, you think about, okay, Victoria Park, Grand Parade, they're unlike, say, Mar Park, which was literally feet from someone's house. Um, these are very quite distant from other people's houses. They're in a very public area, they're very visible, but that's different. Servicing these sites is quite easy. There's already curb cuts, you come in, you drop stuff off if it's a designated site. Unlike some of the other ones, for example, Lower Flynn Park, which we are using and has been designated uh, for quite some time now, we had to make a curb cut. We had to gravel an area so that we could have the truck come up and drop off the porta potty and do all those. And it'll be similar, although slightly different uh, with Saunders Park, but that'll have to be accessed from the other side of the park, coming up a pathway, ripping up some grass, which we'll have to fix and all that kind of stuff. So there's some issues there, which is probably why it's sort of if required, because it's not perfectly ideal. But Pink Ram Parade and Victoria Park are perfectly ideal. When you look at all the ways do you need to service it to it, and I think Councillor Mancini's point and um, Mr. Chauvin, your point just now, if it's a designated, if it's an undesignated site, people are still there. And it's, we can't move them because there's nowhere to, for them to go. And until we get them all the other spots set up, by then there'll be more people out there, it still might not be possible to move them because there might not be a place to go. If it's designated, then we can control it, number of tents and the residents who are staying there in tents don't have to worry about the harassment and the uncertainty that comes with being in a place that isn't designated, that suits our purposes quite well, even though it's been said many times, these are not ideal situations, but we have to deal with what's in front of us. And so for that reason, uh, I can't support the amendment to not designate Victoria Park and Grand Parade because they are, according to what we've set out, more ideal than some of the other places. They're close to downtown, they're close to services, amenities, we can service them properly. So I, I think they have to be included. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. A second go around, Councillor Outhead. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor. And uh, I think that the challenge here is the other events that we want to hold at, at Grand Parade. And, you know, with, it, it, whether we designate it or not, there are tents there and we can't move them. And I, I, I would have liked to see the amendment more of until such time we'll move them at such time as a viable alternative is available. And that's pr hopefully more than just another tenting. 
location, to be honest with you. So, I, you know, I, I'd suggest that could have been a friendly amendment. But I think that what's unique about the one at Grand Parade, even more unique than, than Victoria Park, is the fact that we do want to have these other events there. Be it Remembrance Day, be it Christmas, uh, be it the menorah, be it be the uh, fallen officers, et cetera. So I think I need to understand a little bit, in, in your opinion, Max and Bill, by designating it and then controlling the numbers, in theory, when you designate it, you, you control the services, which I understand. You can also control the numbers, but the numbers, if they're exceeded, we still have that problem, unless there's a viable place to move them, we're not gonna move them. So I mean, it, you know, it's, it's a kind of a vicious circle here, that we, to some extent, we either want people in Grand Parade, or we don't. But I think that the compromise here, it might be to just say, you know, don't designate it, but we're not gonna move them until there's someplace better. Unless you truly believe, and obviously you must believe this because it's in the report, do, do you think there's some really significant advantages to, to designating it? So I, that's what I'd, like to, what I'd like to hear. Bearing in mind that there are other things we want to hold there, too. Uh, Deputy Mayor, through you to the, uh, the Councillor. Designating it does provide us some opportunity to do better services for people, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is important. And uh, if, again, you are correct, all of this hinges on there are other places for right. people to go. Right. But if we designate it and put, and put some recommended maximum numbers right. and we have other places, we are, as the CAO said, able to come to you and say, Mr. Resident, we know you're homeless. Here are some other places you can go. You can't stay here. But you can still say that if it's non-designated too though, right? You can. you can still come to somebody and say, listen, we've got a better place for you here. We're gonna have better services. Nobody's gonna bother you because it's designated. So are I can see advantage just either side, I guess is what I'm saying, Max, and I'm looking yeah. for your, your guidance on this because I think generally speaking, we want to help folks, but generally yeah. speaking, we also want Grand Parade available for other things as well. Yes. So the council's in a bit of a spot on this one. Yes, I, 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 there are some very hard <laughs> choices. I think you've summarized and that no well. One, and no one is saying that we don't want help, and no one's saying that, you know, I, I, that we, A, we don't want them living in tents, and B, if they are living in tents, we want them in better conditions until something yeah. better, even better than that comes along. There's no disagreement about that. But what, I, what makes it easier for us to say down the road, okay, we have the better place now, let's move there, and let's go back to being able to hold events in Grand Parade while making sure we look at you temporarily, look after you better somewhere else until something more permanent comes. I, th I think we could probably all agree on that. Uh, Deputy Mayor, through you to the Councillor. Um, I don't think there is anything that would ever stop us from undesignating a site as well if we no longer needed it. Um, part of the challenge is can we yeah. provide someone with a location that is close to the services and things yeah. they need. Yeah. Grand Parade and Victoria Park both provide that. Yeah. Um, so the question really for us is, can we create a, a situation where in some ways we can have a bit of our cake and eat it too? Yeah. Um, we can provide some space for those that need it, that's near the services and, and features that they want and be able to hold right. events Similarly, in Victoria Park, there are a host of events that have been yes. canceled yes. in there, mainly that happen on the walkways. Right. And so our suggestion is, do we designate a piece that is not part of that, and then we can get back to the various events that happen in that area, people can use it comfortably to walk through, and yet we still, for some people who need something in that area, we have a space where we can go and say, you have a place where you're welcome, that you can go, and that we will serve as well. So you think in the interest, you, you continue I'm to sorry, believe? Uh, oh, okay. I'm so sorry, you, Councillor. So you believe in the designated, believe it designated then? You believe that's the best solution then? Thank uh, you, Yes, Ms. again, Ms. Deputy Mayor to the Councillor, I believe designated sites, because of the better services we can provide, okay. is a, is, and the fact that it tells people 
you have a place you are allowed and welcome to be. And I don't, I, that I think is piece that we don't talk much about. But to look at somebody and say, yes, you're here, and we're leaving you here because there's nowhere to go, is different than looking at somebody and saying, this yeah. is a place. That said, Councillor, I agree, there, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sticky wicket. Yeah, no, and I appreciate the guidance. Thank you, that's why I asked. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Russell, to uh, close. When we first talked about designated sites, we talked about having groups of tents together. No more than four tents would be in a group. If we found that there was density, uh, then that would lead to some of the problems that we have seen in the past. Um, with, and, and, and those groups of four tents, one could be over here and one could be over there on the same site and one could be over here. And so every designated site that we have had uh, well, that we currently have, we currently have five of them. Every designated site has a theoretical capacity based on what we have set out with the rules. How many of those sites have exceeded the capacity? If I could speak to that. Yeah. I'm, um, through the mayor to the councillor, I'm gonna jump in on that first to make sure that uh, when Max answers, I think it's important to discuss um, the underlying assumptions or the premise used when those uh, limitations were arrived at have changed. So that entire selection of numbers needs to be updated. Max. And Deputy Mayor, through you to the councillor. Uh, there were designated preferences for each one. Uh, at some point or other, they have all been over. Some of them three and four times over the number that we preferred to have in the site. And, and, and so we now have 35 locations around town, give or take, where people have tents set up. And we are able, presumably, the sites that have the, the services, the porta potty and the water, um, are in a better place than the others that don't. Um, the challenge that I have is that lots of people have been in touch with me and have said, we want to do things in Grand Parade. We want to do things in Victoria Park. If we allow the tents that are in Grand Parade and Victoria Park, as we are doing it now, we aren't taking anything away from what we're currently doing. I'm not suggesting that because these sites would not be designated that we boot people out. What I am suggesting is that we are able to offer them a better place if there is another designated site over there that does have the additional services. You don't have to be here. There's another place that is better. And that would give us the ability to have Grand Parade and Victoria Park able to be used for uh, the events that we have able to represent our city uh, in, a, in an extremely positive way um, where all of the residents would be able to uh, enjoy the space in front of City Hall. I'm not saying let's take anything away. I'm just saying for these two locations, let's not add this as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, you've inspired additional. Uh, Councillor Clary. <laughs> thank you, Deputy Mayor. I, I was going to let him close, but I just I had to jump back in. As has been said, by not designating it, we're withholding services that they should get. They need to have the water. They need to have the porta potty. They need to have garbage cleanup. We need to have all those things there. The other thing is, um, I believe in an inclusive city. If we have an event in Grand Parade, they should come. They should be invited. Now, of course, we also have to respect their privacy. And so I don't think you're going to have a lot of people, and it's been said, it's in the report, the CAO has mentioned it, Mr. Chauvin has mentioned it, the mayor mentioned it earlier, we will be incentivizing these folks to move to other places, uh, but we have to deal with what we have right now. And so by not designating it, you're withholding the services from the people who need those services that are there. And so, again, for that reason and the others mentioned earlier, we can't not designate it. Thank you, Deputy. Councillor Cuddle. 
Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'm just wondering why we can't provide a porta potty and water without designating it. Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to the council, there is, there's nothing that prevents us from doing that. We just, uh, as Councillor Russell mentioned, there are 35 non-designated sites off and on at times. Um, so the question would be, do we want to provide it to anywhere that somebody is sheltering outside? Um, would be another question. But no, there's no reason mechanically that we can't do that. Through the mayor, the deputy mayor, to the councillor, there are some operational financial limitations though because tents are popping up like mushrooms <laughs> around the municipality and we cannot afford from a staffing or financial perspective to be providing water and porta potties at all of the locations. Hence the strategy of designating some sites in the hope that that's where people will want to be because there will be the water and the uh, sanitary uh, amenities. Thank you, but um, I guess I'm just trying to understand like given the situation right on the other side of this wall where we know there's a number of people um, and we're talking about whether to provide a porta potty depends on whether we designate it or not. Um, I'm just trying to understand what's stopping us from now, not saying that we need to go do all 35, but when we talk about Victoria Park and we talk about Grand Parade, um, where we have a density, a high number of people camping and tenting, um, is there anything, st I'm just trying to figure out what's stopping us now from providing services. Max. Uh, Deputy Mayor, through you to the councillor, uh, we actually do have a porta potty out in Grand Parade, and we do have one at Victoria Park, um, and that was mainly to address the large amount of human waste that was on the ground. Uh, but we would add more as a designated location, uh, if that answers your question. We wouldn't. We wouldn't. We do not supply water to either of the locations other than when uh, we've had an extreme heat wave and then we've su we supply it everywhere as a life, as a humanitarian right. response. And, and so uh, just in terms of water, I know um, like Halifax Water is able to hook up to a hydrant and provide water bottle filling stations. Are we doing that anywhere that could be available not just to people who are sleeping rough and intense but to the general public? Like have we looked at water that way? Uh, no, mainly because under the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board and the Public Utilities Act, you know, water is a metered service. So there are some conditions where if we're organizing a special event and there's a metered account that a water connection can be made to in conjunction with a special event, then Halifax Water will install water taps and the event organizer or the municipality would pay for the bill. But those types of connections to hydrants are only in the summertime because um, it's not an available option in, in the winter time. Right. Okay, thank you. I think that answers my questions. Okay, the board is clear. Question on the amendment? Question has been called, Ms. Clerk. The amendment is to not designate uh, Grand Parade and Victoria Park. I think it would be on your screen. Ah. Uh, Yeah, we're going to have to do this by show of hands. Okay, so clearly we got some technical challenges, so we'll do this by show of hands. So all those in favor of the amendment. Okay, 
that's three. Uh, Councillor Russell, Councillor Hensby, Councillor Purdy. All those in, uh, opposed to the amendment? So Cleary, uh, Morris, Cuddle, Stoddard, Lovelace, Blackburn, Daigle Gammon, Mancini, uh, Smith, and Austin. Oh, and out hits. Sorry, sorry, Councillor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the amendment is defeated, so we are back on the main. Do we need a few yes, moments? Yes, please Ms. just note that uh, in order to stop the voting to move on to another voting, um, and, and maybe I'm incorrect with the system, but um, it displayed the results of it, an incorrect vote, and we will go based on the verbal show of hands that you called out. Okay, I'm glad I, that I, there was some prompt on the side of the room that said do a roll call, so glad we did that. Um, so thank you all. Do we need a moment, Ms. Clerk, to figure out the system, or are we able to operate to carry on here? If you'd like, uh, Councillor Lovelace, if you want to move to perhaps another desk, we can look at what we can do for yours. <laughs> Are we ready to proceed, Ms. Clerk? Okay, so uh, I don't see a board here. I don't know if I'm supposed to be seeing a board here. Um, the main motion, the board would be empty. Um, so if we're done, uh, we could go to the question. No pressure, Ms. Clerk. I'm just wondering, are we repopulating a list here or or should I be proceeding at this moment? Okay, all right. Okay, so that's accurate. Okay, uh, all right, we're gonna go to Councillor. Uh, we'll fix that. <laughs> Settle down. All right, three minutes, Councillor Mancini. There, uh, just very quickly to follow up from the earlier conversation. So, uh, ca uh, Councilor Purdy br brought up Canada lands. I just want to let people know. Uh, initially, uh, the mayor contacted the federal minister, who's responsible for Canada lands, along with MP Fisher, and then connected him with me. Yesterday, the minister was in town. We visited the site. We walked around Shannon Park, uh, the, and he's in favor of uh, leasing the land to us. Uh, our arrangement uh, so we can use it to help with the uh, people living rough. This morning, uh, Bill and Max, myself and the mayor met with Canada Lands. Uh, so we are proceeding for further conversation. We talked about pallet shelters and tents and stuff. So there's still some arrangements. Max is going to do a site visit. And so we are progressing. Nothing has been 100% confirmed yet, but there are good conversations going on. So uh, thank you for bringing it up, Councillor Pretty. Um, should be campground, just for those that might be listening at home, uh, you know, uh, we are talking about trailers, camping trailers. Uh, in this site that was identified by Max in his presentation. We're not talking about temp tents on it. Uh, there's going to be uh, lots of eyes on it, including Max and I, because we live there and we're probably in that, I'm in there twice a day. I know Max is probably once a day. We're in there with our dogs and I'm in there running. So lots of eyes. I will reach out to the community if they want to have a little get together to understand what's happening here. Uh, so we'll, we'll do that also. Um, I get some questions here, Max. So, uh, could you explain what that interaction looks like when you when uh, we have uh, uh, options for people? So we go up to them, we visit them. What's that interaction? How, what you know? How do we? Uh, what's the communication like when we encourage them to go to a, a place that's that's better? Remembrance Day. Maybe this is a question for the CIO. Whose decision is that? on the Remembrance Day services. Who decides? Is that the municipality? Is that the legion that decides on whether we stay or not stay? So looking for some clarification around that. 
how quickly can we stand up the housing court in a position if this motion is passed? So, you know, typically, you know, there's a process to hire somebody in HRM. We, I don't think we have the time to go through that process, the, the typical process. So what's that look like? And are we able to fast track that little bit? I think that's my oh, well, last question. So the rec center possibility, if I understand it, Max, we're considering a rec center if the province can find a facility. Is that correct? And are we talking that rec center would be committed for the whole winter or it's we use as an interim until the province finds a facility? So if you could just clarify that. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, certainly I'll tackle a, a couple of those. The, uh, the interaction when we have somebody, when we have other options, uh, would, would be similar to the interaction that we have when with somebody, for example, uh, shelters on a school ground now. Right. It always begins with an outreach navigator who uh, meets with people, finds out what their needs are, makes sure we connect them with resources, and then inform them that you may be in a location that uh, you can't stay in for whatever the appropriate reason is. They would offer uh, assistance to move. So for example, the, uh, the Youth Works truck and a couple of their folks have multiple times helped people move. Okay. We've also had private companies who have offered that we will come or we would be involved in helping someone move. So we offer that. Um, subsequently, th there's a visit from compliance who sort of issues the formal notice that you can't stay here, again, reminds them of the options, reminds them there's, there's help, there may be some incentives that we've used. Uh, so for example, a common, a common thing is somebody's been tenting in a location for a long time and their tent and structure will not survive moving. Right. So for example, we tell them, we'll replace all of that for you. Okay. Um, and, and there could be a variety of things like that that just aren't structured well. Uh, they may have a large collection of stuff. So we've stored people's belongings and that's another right. project that we're working on is expanding that. So there are those pieces. Um, if the person still is, is resistant, uh, we often have a community response officer. So for those of you in Dartmouth, Ian Walsh is one of those. There's ones in every community. And they would go down and again, remind people, you can't stay here. What do you need for help? Here are options and so on. So it's a, it's a multi-visit process. Uh, we are very, very careful that outreach, outreach workers, housing workers, street navigators do not cross into compliance. Right. Yeah. That is not their role. They would tell somebody potentially that someone's coming to visit them, but they don't. So we very, very strictly separate the roles. So, so that's how it generally proceeds. Okay. Um, in terms of the rec center, if the province isn't able to secure a winter shelter, we believe we would be taking it for the winter season. Um, however, as we said in the report, we also believe that that center must continue long term. So we would not be as much looking, arguably we open it November, in November 6th. We wouldn't be looking to maybe move to a provincial one on January the 4th is the priority. We'd be looking for March 1st, where are we going to have wow. a multi-year shelter that goes on? Um, mm -hmm. And that again is dependent on finding location in both cases. Uh, and without that, then we, we face other challenges. Um, I think I will, uh, I don't know if the CAO wants to tackle the question of fast tracking hiring and or the Remembrance Day. I can certainly tell you what we're hoping to do with Remembrance Day, but I think I will turn it over to her for a moment. With respect to the fast tracking of hiring as quickly as we can get a job description done, we can get it posted. Um, then it will be a matter of, you know, quality of the applicants and how long a process will take. We also um, are looking at other options, you know, to, to enhance staffing within community safety. For example, we have an employee who's going to be returning from a secondment to the province after Christmas and rather than having them go back to their home business unit, we're hoping to place them with community safety. Okay. So yeah. we're looking at ways that we can give um, 
Max and Bill some assistance there. With respect to Remembrance Day, we own Grand Parade, but any decision around you know, what happens with Remembrance Day would be taken in conjunction with the Legion, the military, with our special events staff, and Max would be much more up to speed on whatever plans we have in place there, I think. So uh, through Deputy Mayor, the, uh, I don't, we haven't reached the drop dead, we've got to make choices. So there are active conversations going on at the staff level in multiple areas talking about options. Uh, and again, we still hope that with a winter shelter announcement that it can be in place soon enough to provide options for people to be able to go actually somewhere better, safer, with better services and more comfort. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be supporting the motion on the floor. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Morris. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Max, I'm wondering if you could, um, it, it's hard to understand how we have so few options uh, when it comes to designating sites on the peninsula. Um, just, I know that you've talked a little bit about the criteria that need to be in place, and I'm sure it's simpler if they're HRM owned sites, but uh, is there anything else you can tell us about sort of the process of elimination of uh, finding sites, whether the province has offered any land, whether there's any possibility of using, um, you know, uh, perhaps a corner of Citadel Hill? <laughs> I mean, what, what, uh, are there any options that you've looked at that, or that you would consider would be potential sites that um, have still not been considered? So there is a, an approved set of criteria that has been approved by council for us to look for them. Um, so for example, we did discuss the Halifax Common and a piece of that. Uh, that wasn't uh, something that, that we felt we could practically support. Uh, we've looked at Fort Needham, but that is a, um, uh, in consultation with the councillor, we've talked about that as a, as a formal memorial <coughs> uh, site and therefore sort of doesn't fit within our cultural agreed piece. Um, there, there are, um, there are, we do have the criteria of not within 50 feet, uh, 50 meters of a daycare or a school. So we actually have a map that lays all those circles out around us and not active sport fields. So for example, there are fields uh, that are, that we could look at, but they're next to a daycare, they're in the middle of an active sports field, they're next to a school, uh, there, are, uh, there are a whole host of things like that. Uh, we are talking with folks about private land, um, but those take time, and as I said, there are some that are hesitant on uh, on doing that, and there are some that are keen on doing it if we would be willing to violate our development rules. So we do have uh, developers who say, well, if you let me build five more stories oh. somewhere else, okay. then I will happily provide you with a piece of land. Right. Um, so it's not simple. Uh, did, sorry, I, I, did the province offer any particular locations uh, the, for this? The province had at one point offered us some locations, um, and then we weren't able to come to sort of to sign the deal with those. We are looking at some additional ones. Uh, primarily right now, they are focused on finding locations for the pallet shelters. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of Citadel land, that's federal land, uh, and we've had a conversation with them uh, quite a few months ago, and they were not in favor of allowing um, tents on there. We also talked about garrison grounds, and again, there are events and, and those pieces there. Okay. Any churches, maybe? Churches are, uh, we have had some conversation with churches. Uh, they are mainly interested in micro shelters and tiny homes and things like that. Right. Um, as we know, Tent encampments come with a unique set of challenges, right. and as Councillor uh, Mancini talked about, they don't come with wraparound services, which is what people really want, if they want to take those on. Uh, and ideally, we would like that, uh, but there are fiscal challenges to doing that. 
Um, and I believe bigger than the fiscal challenges is the capacity of the sector with staff. Okay, thank you. Sounds like a very thorough process of elimination. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, if no one objects, I have one question if I can ask from here uh, for a second go around. Um, Max, uh, up in Dartmouth North, um, Councillor Mancini and I had a conversation about, you know, um, you know, Alber Lake not being suitable, and then that kind of led to uh, thinking around the fire station. There's a green space next to that. I'm just wondering if, uh, if that has progressed anywhere. We've made the formal ask. We haven't yet come to uh, an answer. So we're continuing to pursue that. So that would be an internal ask? Like yes. with our... F with our fire. Because it's all, it's all internal, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, thank you. So, question. question. Question has been called. Over to you, Ms. Clerk. We need to do hands again. Okay, so we're gonna get to use your hands the second go around tonight. All those in favor? So that is everybody. All those opposed? Nobody. Okay, so that carries. <laughs> All right. Thank you, folks. Again, please disregard what is popping up on the screen. Otherwise, it will continue to say voting. All right. We won't trust our screens. <laughs> well, in the interest of moving along before the systems completely shut down on us tonight, uh, let's go to members of council, which I think is our next item on the agenda, 1521. This would be Councillor Morris, collection of construction related fines. Councillor Morris. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Put the motion on the floor then. Um, I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to provide a staff report recommending options with respect to bylaw and legislative changes which enable HRM to withhold permits and planning approvals related to construction and development for companies with unpaid fines owing to HRM. So Second. Moved. Second by Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Councillor Stoddard. Uh, so just, just a brief background on this. Um, it, it came to my attention um, a year and a half or so ago that um, there was about a quarter of a million dollars owed to HRM um, in a, a case involving a developer uh, that went through the courts and was decided in favor of HRM, and, but the fines hadn't been paid. So uh, I was concerned about this and um, took it up uh, with the CAO and then we got a new CAO and took it up with our new CAO. And I understand that um, this is, uh, these fines aren't being collected by the province and they have perhaps a long backlog, I'm not sure, but it's not being prioritized. So the purpose of this motion is to find a, a way um, that we could collect on this fine and uh, the money could come to HRM as it's owed. Uh, and I hope you will support it. Yeah, you uh, uh, I think, I think our, our solicitor, solicitor would like to win. No, okay, if I may just suggest, um, because I'm, as I'm reading this now, which I probably helped write, um, <laughs> <laughs> I realize that the, the, uh, the, the unpaid fines are not actually owing to HRM in most cases. They're, they're owed to the province. I would suggest that you amend it by dropping off the last three words and just leave it as for companies with unpaid fines. Okay. Would Sorry. that be uh, friendly there? I certainly I think it's friendly, I heard, a friend, yes. <laughs> I heard yes from Councillor Stoddard, so we'll consider oh, okay. that Good. small amendment right. friendly. <laughs> Good, thank you. I support you. Yes. Okay. Uh, if I could just yep, go ahead, Councillor Just clarify. Morris. So, yes, this is owed to HRM through the provincial courts, um, and the solicitor has clarified that. So, um, I also spoke with our planning uh, team on this, and they thought that they could do something because... Uh, 
If someone's fined and then they come back with new developments, we could withhold their approvals uh, to incentivize the paying of the previous fine. Okay. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Deputy, and support this. So thank you for bringing it forward. I, I've had cases in the past where not as large as the fines as you mentioned, but where fines have been issued for, for developments not following uh, rules. So my only question is for maybe, uh, I guess, to the CAO when this is being written, just you don't have to change the motion, just if, if it's possible that we could possibly include if there's any other files that might be similar where either fi fines are owed or we've been through the court process and we haven't collected. So just wondering if that could also be included in, in the report. That would be friendly. I guess we could do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thank you. I just have a question about process here. So w this money isn't actually owed to HRM at this point. It's to be collected by the province as per the court order. And so I'm, I'm trying to understand as the court uh, receives this money, the province receives this money, how do those funds then uh, get reconciled at HRM through that fine system? And is there an issue with our fine system? Because $250,000 is a little bit much, and I think I heard the councillor mention it's a year and a half that this conversation uh, in her district has been going on. So at what point then is this uh, system or this process actually triggering to staff to say, you know, Houston, we got a problem here? Houston figuratively or literally? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> through, through the mayor to the councillor, I'm uh, always thrilled as an accountant to talk about accounts receivable, reconciliation of yeah, accounts yeah, and collection too. of outstanding <laughs> fines. But I see that our CFO, Jerry Blackwood, is here, so I'm going to ask I, Jerry to come I down. Can address, I can actually Jerry! address the court if you want if it would help. I, I'll try first. The, the fines that are levied by the court, um, when they are collected by the province as a debt owed to the court, there's a deduction of the victim surcharge and the court fees and the balance is then remitted to to the province, or, or sorry, to the municipality. Okay. And so to the extent that it's owed to us, it's really in many ways the same as the parking, uh, parking structure, okay. right? We prosecute those through the provincial court system and then the collection comes forward. The challenge in many cases is that, I shouldn't say many cases, but challenge in some cases is that there is a single person entity, a single uh, uh, purpose legal entity, like a number company, right. that that is struck to build a certain development, they're charged with the fine, and you know, to date, that that can be problematic for the province to collect, and so there are there are some potential mechanisms that we can look at both internally as well as the discussions we're having with the province about the potential for them to assign collection of those fines to HRM um, in the same way that we collect other debts as a charge on the property with the property taxes. But if that business, that numbered company, it no longer exists because it's expired after the building of the building, uh, then, you know, trying to uh, s squeeze money out of a stone isn't exactly possible. It, it, there are pieces to this, I think, you know, as we go through the report and we build on this that we would look at, but ultimately the charge it relates to a property development and the property still exists. Uh -huh. Good. And okay. so in whoever's hands it's at, I think yep. there's opportunities to us to explore to okay. collect on those fines. Okay, excellent. Jerry, want to add to that? Thank you, uh, Jared Blackwood, CFO. Yeah, not much to, to add there. <clears throat> I do want uh, council to be assured that um, you know the process just around the accounts receivable and the revenue piece. So we do get uh, payment uh, through the Dartmouth court and the uh, Halifax court every month, right? So there are fines that range from summary offense tickets, Liquor Control Act, compliance, et cetera, mostly summary offense tickets and, and, uh, and parking. But <clears throat> in those cases uh, with those types of fines, they're kind of uh, on a cash basis of accounting. So uh, we don't book 
the receivable when the prosecution happens because of as course. the solicitor says, they're basically debts of the province. However, from a, a revenue perspective, we do uh, accrue that revenue um, because it is, it is uh, something that is owing to us. So we have uh, an accrual methodology just around that we recognize some of that revenue that is, is, has not been collected. So then we'd also have the expenses as the solicitor has outlined to receive those funds. So there's court expenses, right? No, there's no court expenses to the municipality. No, the, the court is the provincial court. They deduct okay. their court costs and we receive the balance. They deduct their court costs. Yeah, that was so. It's, yeah. it's actually an add on to, to the fine. The oh, fine that you receive, okay. you know, Perfect. will have will have court costs on top okay. of that, victim surcharge. There's a number gotcha. of fees that the courts impose on top okay. of, of the fine that we impose. And is there interest? So this $250,000 that's owed for 18 plus months, is there interest on that? Do we know Off that? Off the top of my head, I can't answer that. As a reminder, this is a request for a staff report. Oh, so I'm, just, probably, I'm just like, I, I, I'm shocked. I, I really, <laughs> I'm shocked that this is the case. Yeah. Sorry, apologies. No, Thank no, you, Councillor okay. Morris. Thank I you, Councillor Morris. I think the uh, explanations have been illuminating. <laughs> All right, the board is clear. Question? Question. 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 We're going to... Yeah, okay folks, so we're gonna vote by hand. Okay. Just a second. Rather, rather than reboot the system now and put that through the delay, uh, let's just vote by hands on the last few remaining issues and then we'll go on. We'd still have to go in camera. We do. Yeah, okay. So all those in favor? All right, I'm not gonna roll call because it's unanimous. Everyone was in favor. Okay, thank you, Councillor Morris. So the next motion is 1522, which would be Councillor Mancini. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. I put the following motion on the floor that the Halifax Regional Council request a staff report directing the Chief Administrative Officer to allocate a portion of the funds received as part of the Housing Accelerator Fund toward the Affordable Housing Grant Program in time for the 2023-24 grant year with the intent to expand the uh, AHGP to eligible possible proposals in suburban and rural parts of the municipality. So moved. I heard a second from Councillor Cuddle. Uh, Thank you, Councilor Cullen. Really quickly, uh, the, uh, the idea is to, uh, as the motion states, to move some of the mo uh, money from the Housing Accelerated Funds, the grant program we have. Council has supported in the past, I think 400K to go towards suburban areas. This is to be able to expand this. But the underlying reason for my motion is to look at Halifax water fees and helping the nonprofit groups. And so the Halifax water fees are eligible as a construction cost under a grant program. So we're putting money into the grant program from this fund. And so there's an example of uh, a nonprofit group in my district on Main Street, the Affirmative Ventures. And you know, one of the biggest permitting costs to that building is the Halifax water fees as we've discussed in the past. So the rationale behind this motion partially is also to, to be able to help these nonprofit groups with the Halifax water fees. So I hope you support it. The motion. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, the board's empty. Question? Question's been called. All those in favor? Aye. All right. That was unanimous as well. So, okay. Thank you, colleagues. So that takes us to uh, in camera. Would someone like to move that we go in camera? Okay. Uh, that's a good idea. Will, any objections to doing notices of motion right now? All right, uh, notices of motion. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, I have one on behalf of Councillor Mason. Take notice that the fut at a future meeting, the Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move that Council consider adopting by policy a, pub a public participation, the purpose of which is to consider amendments to Regional Center Secondary Municipal 
planning strategy, the Halifax Municipal Planning Strategy, the Regional Center Land Use Bylaw, and Halifax Mainland Land Use Bylaw to further regulate water lot infilling in the Northwest Arm in Halifax. And second, uh, take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move that council consider adopting by policy a public participation program, the purpose of which is to support comprehensive neighborhood planning process for a young street lands future growth node as well as key surrounding lands. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Morris. Take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to propose amendments to Administrative Order 2020-007-ADM, Incentive or Bonus Zoning Public Benefits, and Administrative Order Number 2020-008-ADM, Grants for Affordable Housing, the purpose of which is to, one, allow money collected from the Interim Density Bonus Program to be used to fund eligible public benefits, including affordable housing outside of the regional centre, and two, broaden the, circumstance, broaden the circumstances under which an eligible nonprofit organization can partner with private business and retain eligibility for affordable housing grant program funding. Thank you, Councillor. Any others? Councillor Hensby. <coughs> Take notice at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move a that help the council direct the chief administrative officer to provide a staff report exploring the possible transfer of responsibilities for the Sheet Harbor Streetscaping Program area rate from the Sheet Harbor and Area Development Corporation to the Sheet Harbor and Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Councillor. All right, colleagues, uh, would someone like to move that we go in camera? Aye. Moved, second by Councillor Blackburn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, we'll go in camera. Thank you.
Okay. Is everybody, looks like we have everybody back. Just need a solicitor and a counselor out here, and there they both are. So uh, we are on, what's our number? 1514, um, picking up before our in camera. Um, so, as a reminder, Councillor Lovelace introduced this, um, and I moved, we went in camera for a discussion, so we're back on that. Unfortunately, in all our technical challenges this evening, the original board was lost, so if anyone was planning to speak on that, um, you'll have to buzz back in. This is your chance. Councillor Lovelace. Uh, actually, you know what? I should probably wait to close. Um, right now, you would be closing because okay. no one else has buzzed I'm, in. <laughs> then I'm going to close. So I do. What I would like to do is first thank um, staff, and uh, you know I, I appreciate the back and forth between uh, the province and the municipality um, in getting uh, seeking clarification uh, between Section 71 and Section 87 of the Halifax Charter. Um, and the confusion um, mostly to, uh, <laughs> to whether or not the municipality can actually provide um, commercial tax relief. And we do have the motion on the floor, uh, Deputy Mayor, but I would like to um, amend that motion to uh, add, and I don't have that in front of me, Mr. Solicitor, do you have that? I'm just trying to make sure we didn't already do this. <laughs> um, no, I get that. The the yeah. I'm just trying to. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm good. I'm good. I tell you what. Let's. Uh, my my uh, apologies for the confusion. So what we're going to do uh, is I'm going to continue to ask you to uh, reject uh, the motion that's on the floor. That is the staff recommendation uh, to not offer commercial tax relief. And I'm going to put on the alternative. Uh, which is that council uh, uh, not grant uh, commercial tax relief at this time and request clear legislative amendment uh, to the Halifax Charter to enable um, the municipality. So that is uh, the second alternative. Uh, Mr. Solicitor? So that's essentially just an amendment to the motion that's on the floor. I think. I think we'd be better off in the event that you're unsuccessful in your request for council to defeat the motion on the floor. I right. would suggest you move an amendment at this time to to make a request of the mayor to, or sorry, to direct the mayor to write a letter requesting um, that um, the province uh, prepare or provide an amendment to section 87 to make it clear that the municipality can in fact uh, provide commercial tax relief. So right, so, so I think what amendment. you're suggesting is that I that I bake this in yeah. right now to this motion to yeah. amend that now. Yeah. Um, and then at, at, at that time, um, uh, rather than um, keeping it open for the legislative changes, be very specific about the fact that we want um, Section 87 uh, to permit uh, the municipality to offer commercial tax relief. Correct. Right. So, 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 so is everybody okay with that? Does everybody yeah. understand that? Yeah. If, if the staff motion, this, if the recommendation of staff passes, the matter is done. And so you're best to amend that at this time to request, you know, in the event that it hasn't already been done, if, if the mayor is not already written, that the mayor be directed to write a letter to um, the province requesting amendment to section 87 to provide the necessary clarity that the municipality is in, is able to um, provide uh, right to be tax clear, it was relief. staff that requested um, the clarification of provincial staff. It was not a letter from the mayor okay. to um, you know the elected at the province. Okay. So I think I think that's that's the difference here is that right. we're asking for our mayor to actually. We're asking for authority in Section 87 yes. to extend the tax concession to Correct. commercial property owners where it's not currently set out. So, Councillor Lovelace, are you going to you're going to move that as a, yes. a just proposed see amendment? As uh, yeah, as as amendment. Let's as see as what we got here. Written, sir. Requesting the province. Thank you to the clerk. It's a, so, uh, Krista, requesting the province amend the charter, or amend Section 87 of the charter. to, uh, let's see, 
to specifically permit the extension of tax concessions to commercial property owners? You're, you're doing great, Chris. Extension <laughs> of tax concessions to commercial to commercial properties. Right. And so, and so, just to clarify, this is this is in response to the clear language in, in the earlier part of the Charter 71 that says the municipality may not grant a tax concession. So, where where we are talking about tax concessions, um, we are looking for the same clarity that there is okay. in the other sections of the Charter that specifically uh, exempt us from that prohibition, such as 71.3, 71.4, and I think there's a couple other places where clearly the legislature has evidenced an intention that we not be bound by that prohibition. No such section or no such language appears in section 87, which is our authority for giving tax relief. Okay, so uh, d d Deputy Mayor, are you, uh, are, uh, thank you for the indulgence. May I please put the amendment amended yes. motion on the floor? So, We've been just waiting uh, for that. <laughs> I move to direct the Mayor to write a letter requesting the province amend Section 87 of the Halifax Regional Municipal Charter to specifically permit the extension of tax concessions to commercial properties. Property owners. Commercial property owners. Is there a seconder? Second. Thank you. Second by Councillor Blackburn. Uh, so now we are on this amendment. Uh, so I don't have anything else to add other than, um, you know, oh. Krista, we better just hold on to commercial properties. I mean, some are, some are, are any of them We have rented? properties within the I know, I'm just, is it the, because some are, are in fact. To commercial, commercial 101, there are, there are opportunities for, that are, that are, uh, so it would be to provide, for, to buy tax release commercial, with respect to commercial properties, just say with respect to commercial properties, and we'll, for, we'll work it out from there. I think we can call that friendly. So I, so, okay, so to permit the extension of tax concessions with respect to commercial properties. Okay, that's, that's quite clear because again, that kind of mimics what section 71 is saying that we can't have tax concessions at commercial properties. Okay, I'm okay. good with that. Thank you so much. Um, I, I appreciate all this conversation. Okay, so on the amendment, uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Oh, I... I believe Councillor Rota was. Oh, um, yeah, you just go ahead, uh, okay. Councillor. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Sure. Uh, um, Councillor Rota, it seems agreeable over there. <laughs> so I, I want to understand exactly what this, the original motion was about extending tax relief to those properties as a result of the fire. No. This amendment is no. very broad. No, the original motion, the staff recommendation, is to not extend um, tax relief yes. to commercial sorry. properties. Yes, sorry, that's what I meant. Um, and the councillor for the area was wanting to be able to extend the tax concession to those properties. Mm -hmm. This amendment is very broad in that it opens it up for any circumstance. If the so way it's written, am I interpreting that? The, the councillor for the area is asking council to defeat the staff recommendation yes. and, and to go forward with the alternative. In the event that that doesn't pass, she has proposed an amendment to uh, direct the mayor to write the province requesting that the municipality's power to provide tax relief currently to residential property owners be extended to commercial properties. So there is a whole section 87 which deals with this. The request is that it be clarified that that tax relief section would apply for commercial properties as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor, uh, yeah, Councillor Outhit. 
uh, John, just to clarify this, I think what we asked for before and we didn't completely get is we wanted to be able to, and I know Way and I others wanted this, we wanted to be identify certain size of business or the small the small business versus a big business. And we wrote and asked for the, the charter amendments to allow us to, to do tax incentive for small business, just an example. They came back with the zone approach the commercial zone approach that they allowed us to do in the charter. What I'm, and I think where Kathy was heading this, I, I don't want us to look like we are looking for tax concessions necessarily in general to commercial properties, but for disaster relief. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and so do we need to tighten up the amendment a little bit more just so it doesn't look like we're asking for the same thing that they, again, that they refused to give us was, was tax incentives or con concessions in general if we want right. to differentiate small businesses, for example. So are, is, are you right. sure that this is specific enough to right. say we want to do this for, for uh, wildfires and floods mm -hmm. and things? Thank you for raising that and letting me clarify. So section 87 is the provision that is okay. with respect to tax reduction policy. It enables us as a municipality to create a tax reduction policy respecting destroyed buildings. Okay, so, that right? so that's that specifically for that. Currently, you know, as I've said, we have this prohibition and so, yeah. you know, there's uncertainty uh, beyond that. It's, it's just our opinion with respect to whether it applies. So we, we need clarity around that yeah. and, and uh, the protection and for, for councillors, frankly. And I, I wasn't quite sure when you said we need to defeat the motion that was on the floor, but we need to amend it. That doesn't make sense. No, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> the the councillor is asking you to defeat the staff recommendation. Right. Um, but she is concerned that if if she's unsuccessful and the staff recommendation goes forward, then we will miss the opportunity to ask the mayor to write a letter. And so, can we not just amend the staff recommendation and pass it? That's that's what the motion is okay. at the moment. That's, that's the amendment that we're okay. discussing. I, maybe I wasn't listening. That's okay. It's getting late. All right. Thank you all. It is it is late, and it's an unusual hedging of your bets. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so the board is clear, so question on the amendment. Question on the amendment? Commence voting. Well, then we'll go back to the main motion. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a correction there for Councillor Smith who clicked the wrong button. Oh, actually that was unanimous. Well, look at that. Um, it is late. So we are, we are on the main motion as amended. <laughs> Main motion as amended, and as a reminder, um, if I have this right, Councillor Lovelace. Um, Councillor Lovelace is playing the Adams Gambit and would like us to defeat this. Uh, no, she. We just added. We just added in the right letters. It's still. Is that you're you're not asking for us to to defeat this? Sorry. Thank you for. <laughs> Letting me speak. I know that it's late. So uh, I, initially, my hope was that it would be defeated and we would move forward with tax concessions. It is clear uh, at this point in the evening that we're not legally able to okay. give tax concessions. As much as I would appreciate voting this down, we would still be in a position not to offer tax concessions to businesses. So I think at this point with the amendment, I am satisfied with moving forward with this based on the fact that we cannot, unfortunately, due to provincial restrictions, provide tax concessions to businesses destroyed by wildfire. Okay, thank you, Councillor, for thank the you. clarification. That was my uh, close. <laughs> well, I'll almost close, Councillor Purdy, on the main motion as amended. No, sorry, I was just going to get the clarification, but the broadness of this, which was uh, answered because Section 87 okay. is deal, deals with destroyed properties, so that takes care of that. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, uh, uh, Ms. CEO. <laughs> just as a reminder to Council also, the the charter gives us the legislative authority, but 
we also have a bylaw, an administrative order that sets out the programs, and that's how our current program for um, partial tax exemption for properties that are impacted by fire, residential properties, works. So I, I sensed concern from a couple of councillors about the breadth of what may be opened by the proposed wording in the Act. I just wanted to remind Council that although you get enabling changes within the Act, we still have to make bylaws, we still have to have administrative orders to set parameters for programs, and that is entirely within Council's control. I just want Mr. Solicitor. <laughs> just before we close debate, I, I would not want us to leave without, you know, just reiterating um, that the municipality does have the power to assist with respect to payment terms for commercial property uh, property owners. We've been, um, you know, very cautious throughout COVID and, and there's no reason why we would not do so in the circumstances of the fire, firefighters, or sorry, of the wildfires. And the second is, of course, you know, the availability of provincial programs um, to support businesses financially is is still there as well in terms of in the potential for for that to fit within their disaster relief program still exists for those commercial property owners. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're not able, able to help. Councillor Hensby. To play the devil's advocate here, I believe the province will probably will make those amendments for us. If that should occur before August 31st, we won't have a bylaw in place. So the question will be, do we have any legislative authority to give concession even though we have it in spirit from the province, but we don't have a bylaw in place? So that's before October 31st, but if, if the legislation passes, the House doesn't rise till after Halloween, uh, therefore we're already past our due date, then therefore will the taxes still be due in accordance to the current billings? So the, you know, the Section 87 actually talks about a policy. And so it's not a bylaw, so it could be done relatively quickly, but it also provides for retroactivity already, is, in, is enabled. So we could certainly move right reasonably quickly, and if we needed to, some of it might have to be retroactive, but you know, with that clarity, we could provide support. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The board is clear. Question on the main motion as amended. Question is called, Ms. Clerk. Just yeah, right. and, and just to, just before we break, one to Councillor Hensby's question before we voted, um, okay. there is also the need for the director assessment to do a new assessment of the property, and so that that will take time in any event. Um, just to add to that piece of it, but all of that, you know, given the l small number of properties, assuming we have that ability, then um, that would that would get done reasonably quickly, I think. Okay, so we have our some in-camera stuff to ratify, I think, before we can all go home. Yeah, so uh, move the in-camera minutes. Second, Councillor Outhit. All in favor? Aye. That carries. The minutes are approved. Um, so then we have the ratification of 17.2. Uh, Councillor Cleary? Awesome, McPawson. Look at that. The motion's right there. Uh, I move that Halifax Regional Council one adopt the direction provided in camera, and to provide direct that the private and confidential staff report uh, dated August 29, 2023, be maintained private and confidential. Second. Second by Councillor Lovelace. Miss Clerk. Question. All right, that carries. Uh, so that concludes our business tonight. Um, I'm trying to see the date of our next meeting, but I'm not seeing it on, on my phone at this hour. Uh, we will meet in the future. Uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn, Councillor Purdy. Mm -hmm.